Today, we're going to be talking about masculinity, dating, and uh, social issues pertaining to that. There's a big question that uh, many of us have talked about. Why is it that men are failing? They're not going to school. Why is it that testosterone levels are on the decline and sperm counts are on the decline? So we're going to focus a lot on men, but I certainly think that we'll get into issues of gender and feminism along with all of this, dating especially, and gender dynamics. So it's going to be a fun one today. We got a bunch of really awesome people joining us to talk about the issue. Of course, we have Destiny. Hi. What's up? Who are you? What do you do? Uh, I'm Destiny. I do politics and philosophy and video games on my YouTube channel. Right on. And uh, we have John Doyle. Yes, thank you for having me. Glad to be back. And of course, Lauren Chen, a late addition. Yeah, thanks for having me. I realize that I am probably not the uh, most expert on masculinity, but hopefully I can at least add a feminine perspective because of course everyone cares about what the, the woman's issue about masculinity is well, that, today. That's why I asked you to come. Uh, yeah. Last night, you know, we were, were talking about uh, uh, having this show in the morning and then I thought, you know, if we're gonna be talking about men's issues, we have a woman who can also add a, a female perspective, probably a more traditional view on things uh, as opposed to say a liberal woman or anything like that. But uh, you know, that would have been, we, we should get like whatever 2.0, you know, whatever 2.0. I kind of, I don't, I don't know. I, I like whatever for, a, for a variety of reasons. I think we'll be a bit different than whatever's yeah, taken ho on things. Hopefully. hopefully, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> I don't know. They, they, they get accused of being a, a bit more va vapid, I yeah. suppose, but I like it. I mean, it's whatever. It's the whatever <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <Good one. All laughs> so let's, uh, let's just start with the, uh, the, 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 the kickoff story. We have this article from earlier in the year from the New Yorker, What's the Matter with Men? They're floundering at school, in the workplace. Some conservatives blame a crisis of masculinity, but the problems and their solutions are far more complex. Yeah, so this is the, uh, uh, the big issue, I suppose, men's failure to launch. We hear about toxic masculinity quite a bit in you know, various corporate press circles, things like that. We've had the Gillette commercial and other things like that that seem to poke at you know, a view of toxic masculinity. But I'm curious, just to kick it off, uh, if any, whoever wants to start, what's your thought on why men appear to be failing? I assume we were going in order of who was introduced first, but uh, yeah. all right, I'll be like the based alpha male and assert myself into the conversation <laughs> early on, I suppose. <laughs> I think uh, it's probably because we just aren't taught how to be men. I mean, traditionally, men would be taught how to sort of grow into their masculinity by their fathers, grandfathers, uncles. Uh, but now we have a very, I think, androgynous and weak society because of things like you mentioned with um, testosterone going down because of different lifestyle factors, things they're putting in the food, uh, things even in the water is like residual birth control, I think like estrogen in the water but also i think our society doesn't really incentivize positive channeling of those behaviors you know typically if you are a man you're going to want to like impose your will upon the world in some capacity whatever that may be but if you can't do that you're going to turn that inward and self-destruct or you're going to try to distract yourself from that drive naturally with things like maybe drugs video games uh masturbation pornography and so i think that's kind of what we're seeing just because men haven't really been taught by their fathers who they're largely absent from their lives in the first place now how to actually be a man and now people don't even know what that means like if you ask someone how to be a man and even you look in like in the red pill community they'll say well being a man is like you know having sex with lots of women and smoking cigars and drinking whiskey <laughs> and it's like this caricature it's like a costume of like what masculinity actually is and so no one really has a clear definition of it because I don't think the definition is actually that interesting like if you'd go back a hundred years and be like how do I be a man it's like I don't know just like do it it's supposed to be something that happens naturally and I think that as our society has devolved, we've had so many impediments introduced that prevent people from doing that naturally. They think they have to like reinvent it into some really complex thing. You have to take these courses and read these books. I mean, that's not the case. You should really be able to just kind of develop into it, I think. I wonder if it had something to do in the past with survival mm. in that uh, men fought wars, put out fires, were hunting and things like that. And as we've advanced as a civilization in terms of uh, technology, survivability has become less and less of an issue for us. We have too much food now. And so is there really going to be this manly man who's super ripped with a big beard chopping down trees? Or is it going to be some beer belly guy driving around in a heavy machinery who just presses a button and has it done for him? So, you know, we have this traditional view of masculinity with these heroic images of men that we don't need as much anymore. 
Yeah, I think that's definitely possible. I think that it's still possible, though, for men to be heroes, even in this, like, post-industrial society. But I think they're prevented from doing so. I mean, even, like, in school nowadays, boys can't stand up for themselves on the playground because they have, like, zero tolerance policies, which teach kids that, like, violence is absolutely never something that's permitted. So if some kid's picking on you and you fight back, you are now going to be suspended as well. Um, you also have things like they're bringing these social workers and counselors to try to tell boys that, like, if you have a problem, you have to talk about it and there's probably something wrong with you. They even try to turn their the, the students like against their parents in some cases. If kids are like, you know, my mom destroyed my Lego set because she was mad at me. A whole Lego set destroyed? That was something I remember happening to one of my buddies when I was in elementary school. So I think it's like taking children and basically teaching them to be a cog in that system that you described without saying, you know, you can climb to the top. You can be a hero. You can still do things that are noble even if you're not, you know, protecting your community from Indians. You can protect them from criminals. But now the law has made that largely impossible in many cases as well, I think. Well, most of the institutions that young men interact with are run by women. If we look at the education system, it is a more feminine view. And the way that little girls learn and little boys learn, it's not the same. And it's not that one's better than the other. But I feel like that, in addition to the fact that social workers, for example, overwhelmingly female, psychologists, psychiatrists, overwhelmingly females, there are so many women who I think have the best intention when it comes to shaping men's lives, but I think they're not realizing that men and women are different. So that masculine leadership that you were talking about, that's largely missing and it's been replaced with either nothing or maybe too much of a feminizing influence. What do you think? I don't think men and women are that different. Um, I do agree with one thing that was said, though. I think one of the big issues you run into is there's literally no good advice out there for how to, I guess, help men. Because it seems like on the left, they just don't want to talk to men at all. They're just exclusively talking to women or maybe minority men. Um, and then for people on the right, it's this very strange caricature of masculinity. It's funny because you pointed out like that the red pill talks about a caricature of masculinity. But I feel like sometimes conservatives talk about characters of masculinity, too. Um, I feel like when we talk about masculinity, everybody wants to talk about like the really sexy, like fighting the kid at at lunch that yes. broke your Legos or <laughs> fighting with your parents or whatever. The reality is, and I say the same shit to red pillars who say, well, it's important for you to be masculine because somebody breaks into my house. I need to get my assault rifle and tell my woman to hide my... Like, life, 99% of life is not these moments. Like, how you, successful you are in life really comes down to, like, can you maintain a sleep schedule? Can you have a decent diet? Do you have enough discipline to go to work, show up to your job? Can you graduate school? Like, these are... Not only are these, like, the most important... They're oftentimes the hardest ones. It's a lot harder to maintain a 4.0 GPA, get a scholarship, go to school, than it is to stand up to a bully one time on the playground. But it seems like those are the sexy, like, moments that everybody wants to obsess over. And then in the meantime, when you look at, like, the, the woman's side of things, women have been taught to have more control over reproductive health. They're taught to go to school and succeed in ways that we never thought they could before. They're taught to enter the job market and get jobs and make money in ways they never thought they could before. Um... Women have been doing a good job at kind of like leveling up all these different aspects of their lives. Nobody wants to talk to the men on the left and the people that are talking to the men from the right are like, well, you guys just need to be even more masculine even though I don't see any future where just being even more masculine is equipping you to succeed in a world where your outcomes are largely determined by like how successful you could be at a white collar office job or how successful you could be sitting down, you know, eight hours a day in a school setting like in college. I suppose that's true. I don't know if while it does seem sort of silly when you lay it out that way to focus on, you know, these heroic standards as opposed to what is more practically applicable. It is true, though, that like even when men do go down those paths and they do them successfully, they don't feel fulfilled. They don't feel happy. They feel very, you know, inundated and restless. And I think that's partially why the male suicide rate is like unprecedentedly high, because, yes, they are checking these boxes and they're living successfully as determined by how society might want that to be defined, but they still do not feel like they're living as men. I mean, even, you know, for example, if there were a guy who were making good money at a job, white collar, and he steps outside his office to go get into his Mercedes and he gets like robbed by somebody who doesn't have a gun. They just like beat the shit out of him. Wait, can I swear? I don't remember. I don't remember the rules here. <laughs> I don't um, know if we have any. I don't know. Uh, he's going to feel like emasculated. You're going to feel bad about yourself because you were unable to defend yourself. And especially if his girlfriend or if his wife sees that, I don't care how much feminist literature she has read. If your woman ever sees you get beat up by another guy, she's never going to look at you the same way. I don't care how understanding she says that she is. Oh, he was bigger than you, whatever. She will never look at you the same way again because whether or not we like it, they have been wired biologically to seek out men who can protect them. Even if now they don't necessarily need the financial stability that maybe they would have required, you know, 100 years ago, they still have that instinct to pursue that. And so, 
I think that those moments too. I mean, how many guys too I, I, I just, are I, now living in the glory day, or um, living in like this very comfortable lifestyle who still reminisce upon, uh, back to when they were like the captain of the football team or back, you know, in their glory days or even like post traumatic stress disorder. I mean, properly understood, we learned this in Vietnam. It's not like guys are so traumatized by war. It's that they go and they experience that brotherhood and that glory and they come back and they're like in a box. I mean, the Hurt Locker actually explored this very well. You read the interviews from like after Vietnam, these soldiers are coming back. It's not just that they're traumatized. It's that life after war is boring. So I think there is something in the male brain that's wired to pursue that. There's okay, lots of so, uh, yeah, a few things. So one, that uh, PTSD is absolutely not. I was with my brothers and then I came back. Um, that I, I don't think that is a driving factor of PTSD. I think a driving factor of PTSD is the human uh, central nervous system being stressed beyond whatever a human is meant to deal with in life and death situations for sometimes extended periods of time, um, sometimes with other physiological things lacking too, like sleep, diet, whatever. That, But regardless of that, again, we hit on the, there's another red pill talking point, like what is a woman looking for in a man? Protection. Like, where do you live? Is this like in Pakistan or are we like in some civil war place? Like, we live in the United States of America. I don't think protection is the thing that, like, most people probably want a guy that earns a decent paycheck. Um, but is, is that not financial protection? Yeah, but that's not the protection that he was talking about, <laughs> right? You, if, if you want to broaden protection to be so overly broad and meaningless that it includes things like making money, you can do that. But when people say protection, I mean, he was talking about, like, if your wife sees you get beaten up, blah, blah, blah. Like, True. if we take the totality of divorces and relationships ending in the United States right now, is like saw my husband get beat up, is that even going to make the top 50? <laughs> I I'm guessing it's, pr it's probably nowhere near on that list. It's a similar <laughs> impulse in the brain, though, because I think women are initiating something between like two-thirds and 80% of divorces, and largely they just cite that they feel unfulfilled. I think that can manifest in a variety of ways, but I think it's like they're looking at their husbands as less attractive for whatever reason. Well, that's, You can even see studies, too. Women that earn more than their husbands in a long enough timeline are more likely to divorce them because they don't have that traditional perceived ability to, like she mentioned, protect financially. But I agree with Wait, wait, real quick, hold on. Neither of those two things are completely true. Number one, the divorce rate gets cited a lot. There's a reason why women overwhelmingly initiate divorce versus men. And that's because oftentimes women have more to they, they need to secure by doing so. If a man and a wife get together and things, you know, better out or whatever, things don't work out, especially if the woman is a child, that woman has to file for divorce. If she wants to qualify for benefits, if she wants to get any kind of child support, if she wants to get any kind of welfare, otherwise her husband's income is constantly going to be taken into account when she's trying to apply for any assistance or need. So women are oftentimes highly incentivized to get divorced because a man can be like married and not give a fuck forever socially there's probably less stigma like oh i'm separated from my wife she's whatever versus a woman being like well i'm still married but i don't see my husband so socially there's a lot of stigma behind um who would call this cause a divorce and then for uh, financial benefits a woman with a child whose husband is no longer in the picture and helping she absolutely needs to file for that divorce in order to qualify for anything she might need to maintain a household um number one um number two after the divorce thing you brought up the what was the second thing oh shoot i don't even remember um, fuck, was it the protection thing? Fuck, I lost Probably. it. But the number one thing was, yeah, not, yeah. Well, so I, I just, quick Google search, mm -hmm. singular source, Forbes advisor uh, says that lack of commitment is the uh, pr primary reason for divorce. 75% of individuals cited lack of commitment, 60% cited infidelity. So Damn. it seems like infidelity is the real reason for divorce, which kind of sounds like if either individual in the relationship is cheating on each other, they've already Right. They've so, already broken their relationship. I mean, as this it is. is something I'll push back at the 80% of women filing for divorce. I think there's a difference between a woman filing for divorce and a woman being responsible for the divorce. If it's a case of infidelity specifically, a man can cheat and a woman can file for divorce because of that. But can you really blame the woman for the marriage failing in that case? I don't think so. But I think lack of commitment here is defined separately from infidelity. Um, lack of commitment could be like, you know, he's not bringing to the table what I thought he was, something like that. These sort of like vague reasons that are hard to define. Infidelity, I would agree with, but I mean, it does but, say like 75 percent would be I want to I want to I want to ask that question what causes infidelity could it be sexual uh, you know uh, uh, desires that a man has or a woman has they're not being fulfilled with or could it be that something in their relationship already broke where an attraction has waned for a variety of reasons which resulted in them seeking there's probably one a variety of reasons of why it's monogamy See if everybody had open relationships, there'd be no more infidelity. Boom. That's, Next topic. That's just like saying if we if we it's make like, all crime legal, there'll be no more crime. Yeah, okay. Have you seen the purge? Uh, okay. <laughs> Their world is better off for it, according to the lore. So 
Um, well, no. you know, it, maybe if we did live in the purge, my argument would be better about needing protection or something. But <laughs> no, the rich people would probably still buy better. like huge houses. I do with think 50 there's something to be them. said because you know they've done cross cultural studies, for example, where you look at like stereotypes of masculinity or femininity, and you ask all these different cultures, you know, what they tend to seek in a potential mate, and we find that they basically hold up that men are looking for you know women who are young and beautiful, implying the role of the mother. Women are looking for men who are you know strong and ambitious and of resources, implying the role of the protector and the provider. So while it is true that yes, your need to be protected by a man is much lesser than that it would have been, you know, 100 years ago, I think that biological impulse is still there, which is why we see it across cultures. And so the question becomes, how much is our society going to undo that biological impulse to seek that uh, with how Wait, women are Wait, can I find on that real quick? Okay, Th when we cite, okay, first of all, the marriage thing is a really good thing, right? If we say 60% of relationships end in infidelity, right? I know they didn't say that, but let's say 60% of relationships end in infidelity. Why did the relationship end? To say cheating, um, Lauren mentioned, doesn't really get to the heart of what happened, right? Because it's it's possible that like by the time cheating has happened, it's because the relationship is, has already fallen apart, right? Like here, this is, I haven't seen data on this, but I would be, I would bet my life on this, that you can probably track the success of a relationship based on how much sex the man and the woman have. However, would you say that like, well, you know, we had sex like once every three months, that's why the relationship ended? Probably not. You probably stopped having sex because other issues were starting to crop right. up to make it happen. Um, we take these numbers sometimes, and I, if you want to talk about a study, I think it's important to talk about the entirety of a study and not to pull numbers. Because I'm familiar with the Michael Sartain, I think, and Rolo cite these numbers all the time that these cross cultural things, they do this polling data, they see what people want. Just because people find a certain thing attractive doesn't necessarily mean that's what they chase. For instance, here's a data point. Here are two different data points that almost seem to contradict each other. One is that I think that for men, I think the ideal age of like female beauty, depending on what you're looking at, is anywhere from like 18 to 24, um, de depending on what study you're looking at. But if you look at the average difference of the age of a relationship, it's like 2.7 years, I think. So even though men in general might say like, oh my God, like I really like young women that are like 22, on average, the choices that you're making in life aren't gonna 100% map onto the thing that you find attractive. Same thing with women. Women might say that I prefer men that are, you know, six feet tall and blah, blah, blah. And these are like your dream preferences. But when it actually comes to settling down in a relationship, they're not picking like the optimal things that they fantasize, they're making more realistic choices. And I think it's important to contextualize numbers when we talk about things like that. In fact, I think one of the red pill dating talking points is that young women, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying I agree with it, this is one thing they say, that young women will uh, rack up a high body count at a young age, and then once they're in their 30s, think, oh, I need a stable guy who's actually gonna be there for me. And they end up settling down with a guy who's like an average dude with a good job. It's true. Mm -hmm. Many such cases. And I think there is something to be said that while, you know, what you desire is not what you're always going to be able to get, that impulse is still there. So you can be a very beautiful young woman, desire that guy and maybe get him, maybe choose to exploit your beauty for other purposes and then settle down later. But settling doesn't mean you decide that this is unrealistic just because it's like unobtainable. It's more because, well, what am I working with? What can I bring to the table to get that? Because the guy in that position is well aware of that desirability. And so he can leverage that to, you know, get a woman who's more in alignment with what he finds desirable. So I I don't think it's necessarily like, you know, I wish I could fly, but I can't. It's like, this does exist, but I can't get it for whatever reason. Well, I, oh. I find looking at the red pill community versus, for example, um, you know, some of the extreme whatever women, uh, like the, the podcasts, that is, there's a, a, a big stark contrast between red pills, red pillars who might say, oh, well, no woman is going to want someone who's under six foot tall, which is absolutely not true. I mean, people, people on the internet act as if no one ever, no one who's 5'10 has ever gotten married as a man, which is absolutely <laughs> not the case. Um, and then, you know, uh, on the other side of things, you, you might also have a, a, a extreme feminist who's saying, oh, well, women can do whatever they want. Men should not care about body count because it doesn't matter, which is also not true. People have preferences preferences obviously but we're working within the fact that we have to deal with real people who are imperfect so i think anytime we're looking at these polls people online can be really i don't want to say autistic about them but act as if these they're the gospel truth but destiny is right people are a lot more nuanced in their actual behavior well let, let me just you know ask the the woman who's here would you would you divorce your husband if he got beat up in front of you no are you lying? No. I mean, my <laughs> husband does do BJJ and he's a pretty big guy. Oh, but, so there you go. Uh, no, See, no. She but can't I, even conceive of the possibility because he's already taken into account that because he agrees. He knows it's true and that's I, why he trains BJJ. Well, I think there is, I, there is, there would be something inherently emasculating about seeing your husband get beaten up in front of you. Um, aside from the fact that he's your husband and you love him and you're worried about him getting beat getting be beaten up but obviously no uh you know most women aren't looking for someone who is literally uh who who was uh you know game of thrones jason momoa 
Carl Drogo. They're not oh. li- looking for that extreme example of masculinity, but there's something inherent in women where they're they're looking at a man and I think the lizard brain is asking, could he physically protect me? They like men who are strong, who have muscles, who are taller. I think that goes, that's there for a reason. It's because of the physical prowess. I think when I, when I think of like masculine and feminine traits, I think that they're important, but I think that people have a more realistic view of how they influence people. I think these are things that exist as the edges. They're like the spice that you can add to a relationship. So like if you find, I'll say from the male perspective, you find a woman that's like really stable. Uh, maybe she works like a decent job. If you care about that, um, you have a fun time. You've got a lot of chemistry together. Like these are like the, the really important things. You have a similar communication. Style. These are the really important things. Now, if she also happens to have a great butt, big boobs, she's short, whatever the fuck, she's blonde or whatever you're into. That's like a cool bonus. And I think it's similar for women too. Like if you find a guy and he can provide for you, he's got a good job, really stable, good relationship with his parents, likes kids, all this stuff, that's cool. If he's also like six feet tall, if he's also like super muscular, those are like cool bonuses. But I don't think people are usually deciding relationships on those like side factors, unless they're really, really, really young. Like a 20 year old dude might be like, I'm dating that girl because she's got huge tits and I don't care that she has BPD and she slashed her last boyfriend's tires. <laughs> or the girl that's like, I'm dating this guy, he's so fucking hot. I know he's got a lot of tattoos and he just got out of prison like two years ago, but I'm doing it. You know, like if you're really young, you make stupid decisions like that but in general these are like bonuses not like the deciding factors i was reading this uh, analysis from a dating website a dating app and they mm-hmm. broke down um level of attraction by age and the interesting thing was uh well, i shouldn't say interesting the creepy thing is that men they actually when shown pictures of women overwhelmingly choose underage women like disgusting i've seen as low as 16 sometimes exactly yep. towards, yeah. and this is you, know, you, you wouldn't be, uh, this is why it's not surprising to learn that the models you see in a lot of ads, when you go to the mall and you'll see like women, they're like 15 and 16 years old. Creepy stuff. However, when actually introduced or asked about women of that age, men overwhelmingly say no, because I mean, like who want, who, what, what adult wants to hang out with a child? It's, it's just, so what ends up happening is, uh, according to this, this one dating app's bit of data, I think it was OkCupid, okay, they said men overwhelmingly want 22 year old uh, women because they're adult in mind and young and attractive. So while the industry may pursue these younger women, typically like 17 or 18, still too young in my opinion, uh, men are overwhelming like, yeah, okay, that 18 year old girl might be attractive or whatever, but who wants to spend their time with someone who's inexperienced and not capable of, you know, navigating the world. But 22 does tend to be the number for guys across the board. I think it was okay uh, that showed this data where no matter how old a man is, He's liking and messaging 22 Leo, year olds. Leonardo DiCaprio. That's right. Mm-hmm. And no matter how old a woman is, she's dating within, her, she's trying to date within her age range, like w- w- a comparable age. Yeah, I think that uh, a lot of what he mentioned is true as far as like people getting more realistic with their dating standards. But I wonder how much of that is just because as you get older, you yourself, whether you're a male or a female, accumulate more baggage, you know, past relationships, crazy exes. You know, as you get into your like 30s or 40s, if you're still dating, you can't exactly go into it, I don't think, with the same sort of like optimism and and blank slate, so to speak, that you might have been able to when you were 20. You're also far less mature when you're in your you know, early 20s. So yeah, you're going to want to pursue the girl with BPD who's going to slash your tires. <laughs> There's something fun about that. It's a stepping stone. But yes, as you get older, you do kind of have to get more realistic about, I think, the world around you. But I don't think that negates sort of like the core of what makes people attracted to each other in terms of like the, you know, the masculine or the feminine side. You, yeah, you- I- I was going to say, I, again, I agree with that core, but it's just, it's what everybody talks about. It, it would be like having a discussion of like, what is the best car to take to the track? And 95% of the discussion is around like the spoiler or the seats. It's like, yeah, I, like I, some aspects of these could matter for comfort or luxury or maybe even for aerodynamics or whatever. But like the main thrust, and this is my thesis in the beginning, the thing that I hate is that you've got, obviously, progressives and left-leaning people don't want to talk to men because they're all rapists, um, but the people on the right that give the advice, it's all focused on this on this very niche hyper-masculine thing that, one, the vast majority of men will never get to. Most men aren't going to earn six figures, let alone be the millionaires, let alone have the 50-woman body count by the time you're 35, or get the vasectomy when you're 20, whatever all these other replicas say. Most of them aren't even going to hit that point. And then secondly, in terms of how people can improve themselves for relationships, I don't think in general the complaint is like, God, there's just not enough like ultra masculine men. I think usually the breakdowns are more along the lines of like, these guys suck at communicating. They don't have very good like socialization skills. We don't have very good chemistry. Don't know how to conduct themselves properly in public. Maybe can't do anything in a house, like doesn't know how to do laundry clean or 
even make macaroni and cheese or make their bed. Like, I think that these are the things that kind of need a lot of focus. As cringe as it is, I used to make fun of them a lot because I didn't think that a lot of men had this problem. I honestly think Jordan Peterson's advice of like, make your bed and take care of your own shit before you go into the world is way more important than like, you got to hit the gym because you never know when 17 assailants are going to hop out in an alley and try to stab to death you and steal your woman, you know? Yes, but hitting but, the gym is in line outside that of that weird, yourself. weird, like the idea that you're going to hit the gym to become strong to fight is silly. But the idea that you hit the gym for yourself... Self-improvement is good, yeah. True. Right, agree, cleaning yeah. your room. Yeah, you should definitely just train a martial art instead of just going for strength purposes. Or learn how to shoot videos a gun. All the time. <laughs> or that, right. the I, ultimate equalizer. I actually agree, like, completely with what he's saying insofar as I find the whole discussion between, like, you know, the OnlyFans woman versus the red pill guy to be, like, so bad that they should almost be arrested because <laughs> it is making me a danger to myself. Like, there's probably a legal argument to be made there that it's, like, threatening my life in a way just because of how stupid that discussion is. Because it's exactly as you said. I mean, most people aren't going to get to that point. And if you talk about the core of the issue which is that men aren't men anymore everything just falls into place there you know there's a great picture that goes viral on twitter every now and then of like some football player kissing some cheerleader and the guy's like do you think that this guy had to like read a book on how to be a man or like you know read uh forms on how to like talk to girls and get a girlfriend it just fell into place because he was normal and men nowadays are very like introverted and antisocial, and so these things don't fall into place so yeah i agree it's like we were talking about this before the show it's like almost this weird revenge of the nerds fantasy where you've got all these guys who love watching their favorite red pill guy put that only fans girl in line and tell her she's not going to be happy she's probably happy i mean maybe she'll get depressed later but she's probably doing okay because she's making millions well, of dollars wait, real quick cetera, on that because again it's the same sales. one most guys never played football i don't even know that like the majority of guys were not on the high school football team the football teams are not big enough number one <laughs> number two i think it's funny that we go to football for example aren't these the guys that like rape and beat their girlfriends more than like any other profession <laughs> for like it nfl might, players it, and shit like it might, not be, what are the NFL. It might be the cops, NFL, though. Though. i knew that point was coming um, I knew that. Not football, but I think most guys have the cop some number actually. Like, I think high school too, level about athletics or something. I didn't play football. I ran track, played baseball. Well, I'm I mean, just saying, like, if we set the standard, it's like, don't you want to be the uh, captain of the football team? It's like, damn, most people aren't going to be the captain of the football team. Well, it's a really, well yeah. I feel like I feel like the problem with the red pill community and some conservatives. I wouldn't I wouldn't call them in the sphere of Christian conservatives, but they're so obsessed with talking about how the how to find the right mate that none of them ever actually get married and live the values that they preach. Like, if you're you're so focused on dating culture, that's great, but it needs to be dating toward marriage and if you're so obsessed with telling people like you need to find the girl with all the right attributes at the peak age they're never actually going to find a realistic person and then get married and have a family which should be the ultimate goal so, and i feel like a lot of red pill community people are being called out right now by christians who have families because it's like what you're doing you may think that you're trying to fix hookup culture but you're really just in indulging in it it's basically the same thing because it's taking the problem that men are facing and it's just selling them like a repackaged solution, which is that we don't feel as though we have meaning and purpose. And so it's saying, hey, you're upset because you're smoking weed and masturbating. Well, what if instead you were doing better drugs and sleeping with <laughs> OnlyFans models? It's like the same hedonism. You're just pursuing right. pleasure at like a higher degree of like exclusivity, I uh, guess. Uh, uh, you, it would be better off if they said, how about you were eating healthy and working out? And instead of obsessing yeah. over, you know, weird porn and video games, you obsessed over, you know, how many reps you could do or how far you could run. But uh, take a look at this. This is from uh, Date Psychology. This is a, a relatively older story that goes back to 2018. Young male virginity on the rise from 2008. In 2008, uh, men under the age of 30 reported, 8% uh, reported being virgins. Now 27%. I'm curious why you think that is and whether you guys think it's a good or bad thing. I would be careful with this because I think there was recent data that showed that this is like a pretty unfortunate blip. You could try to find this, but that red pillars for, I think it was two years ago, there was a data point that came out that was similar to this. And obviously all the red pillars are like, oh my God, young men are getting laid. All the women are hypergamous and they're all fucking the one Chad guy, blah, blah, blah. But I think the most recent data shows that it's basically back to where it was before, that it was probably a blip like pre or during COVID or whatever. You could try and find that though. I'm not 100% sure on that, but- Do you have any, uh, do you have any big, idea what the source might be? Um, fuck, I don't even know what you would Google. I'll, right, I'll look no. around for it, okay? Do my best. Yeah. But, uh, so let, let's operate into the assumption it may be true. Mm -hmm. Is it a good or bad thing? And, and I'll tell you why I ask. One, I'm sure a lot of conservatives and Christians are like based, you know, based like, young you, men waiting for marriage. Yeah. And my- Stay pure kings. And uh, so uh, Seamus Coughlin, for instance, a uh, good friend, he's on Tim Castile fairly often. He is uh, very Catholic. And when I mentioned this, he said, based. And I said, it's not. We're talking about guys who are 28 who should be married, like by the conservative standard, should be married and should not be virgins. 
if we're talking about 28 year old, 30 year old men who are a third of them who, who are virgins, we're talking about guys who have not like gotten married. They're not having a family, they're not having kids yep. and they're not having any relationships at all. So, I mean, I personally want to be careful here to not shame virgins or, you know, any, anything like that. Um, but I think when we look at the more macro level, you're right. Uh, this is a trend that is not a good thing because in a healthy society, we should be seeing people getting married, having those relationships and starting their families. And I think the reason why that's not happening for a lot of men is because uh, the incentive of pursuing a relationship is has been destroyed for many reasons. Number one, we have pornography, which I mean, obviously sex throughout history has been a pretty great motivator for men. And frankly, there's just for a lot of men, they're looking at the dating market, they're looking at dealing with women, and they're thinking, why bother? I can get whatever I want on the internet, which is not a healthy thing because, I mean, sex is about more than just the physical aspect of it. You want to be building a relationship with somebody. And I think we also have a lot of young men who are just frankly feeling so demoralized. They're dropping out of society in a lot of different ways besides relationship like work and everything. And it's all just contributing to, I guess, men not doing so well. Yeah, I remember when that uh, headline came out, there were a lot of trad caths on Twitter who were like, based, <laughs> reject degeneracy. But yeah, that's not great. Happening. I'm not shaming virgins. However, there is more context to the, that number. I mean, there's no way that 27% of guys, even if that figure is slightly outdated or maybe significantly outdated, are actually abstaining. I mean, maybe there is this sort of like revolt against the modern world. I want to abstain from guys who are maybe more online, more involved in right wing politics. But the average guy nowadays who is in that age demographic, who's a virgin, isn't like living a sexually chaste lifestyle. I mean, he's probably addicted to pornography and he probably struggles to make eye contact with waitresses, probably just like a very, you know, introverted antisocial guy. And I think that's because of, you know, maybe the, the father wasn't present. I think fathers are like pretty much almost chiefly in charge of like the child's socialization. Like you can usually tell, this is interesting too, when a child is raised by just their father, you usually can't tell, but when they're raised by just their mother, you can tell much easier, I think. Um, I think because it largely affects how the child develops like socially. Wait, we, Traditional families, doesn't the mother do most of the parenting? Like, isn't the traditional thing that the dad goes to work, it comes home, he kind of watches TV and chills a little bit. You might interact with the kids a little bit, but traditionally, I feel like the mothers are the ones that are, like, driving their kids to school, taking their kids to football practice. So that's, like, generally the mom's thing in, like, the traditional relationships. Probably, but I think dads play with their, especially their boys, a lot more in ways that are engaging. Uh, they allow their boys to do things that are, like, more, I guess, adventurous or risky. And I think that really, like, helps the way that they view the world and themselves as not fragile. Because if you're antisocial, I mean, what are you ultimately afraid of? This person is not going to like me they're not going to talk to me i'm just going to kind of stay in my bubble if you have a dad who's letting you like climb to the top of the play structure play on rocks things like that you're going to be like wait a minute i have agency i am sovereign i am not afraid i am not fragile and i think that does actually affect how boys grow up and become young men not okay. just, not just I, boys but also women like the effect of fatherlessness is just as stark for women as it is for men you can actually chart uh like likelihood of teenage pregnancy uh, age of losing your virginity for a woman there's a big influence that fathers have on girls too I think something that, um, so that article that you brought up, this was the one that I was familiar with actually, and I had read it. I just saw the headline, so I thought it was something different. Um, I, I think that there, so all of these explanations are like fun and they kind of fit into our narrative of like fathers are important, blah, 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 which they are, I agree with. But I, the there's always this huge like monster lurking beneath the water that people seem a little bit reticent to blame or attack because it's not as much fun, it doesn't play into our fun narratives. But I think that the the two huge things that one, they play into each other, one is lack of types of socialization and two is the explosiveness of the internet, which is dramatically played into that. I think that the internet has fundamentally and radically altered the way that we associate with each other in some ways positively. You can talk to people all across the world. You can come on shows like Tim Pools and you can do all this stuff, which is cool, but in other ways, incredibly negatively in that a lot of the cool things that happen with human socialization aren't things that like your parents necessarily prepare you for. They're not things that you read a book about and meditate on. They're things that just kind of happen naturally. Um, when I was in high school, um, first of all, social media didn't exist really. Thank God. We had like MySpace and LiveJournal. Um, cell phones were used to like set up social events and the social media that did exist like Facebook was exclusively used to like track parties right so if you've got a group of friends that you see in real life you see their friends you see their friends of friends and then you go to like parties to talk with other people you go to parties you see other people in these environments a few things happen one you're more likely to do like things like drinking and whatnot two you're more likely to have driver's license um, three you're more likely to see girls or guys and then four you're more likely to go on dates and have sex um, 
there's a lot of uh, graphs listed. If you're looking at the same thing, because I looked it up to check this article, if you look at like the um, the, the bottom of these uh, that page, you can see the numbers on a lot of these socialization things have actually gone down quite a bit. So the difference between 94 and 2014, so that's not even all the way to 2023 uh, where we're at now, right? Um, in 1994, 84.7% of 12th graders had a driver's license. That number was down below 73%, so an 11, 12 point drop um, by 2014. The tried alcohol number had decreased by 15 points. The had gone on a date, decreased by 25 points, worked a job for pay, dropped by um, 16 points, right? You see this like trend towards more education because you got to go to college, you got a degree and more socialization done exclusively online. And I don't know what Discord servers you hang out with, but they tend to be very gender segregated. If you're on a Discord server where you're talking about like edgy jokes and like video games and stuff all the time, there are no girls in there ever. No, not to knock any of those servers. But um, yeah, I think that the, I think the internet has a lot of the life that worked for us only worked because it was so on rails. You go to school, you have your friends, you have all this, and the internet stuff has like changed a lot of our socialization in some ways for the worse. I, I, think that's- I, I, I agree. I wanted to respond because there's, there's one thing that we've talked about quite a bit, and that's uh, dating apps. And I think cell phones in particular, not just the internet. You mentioned Facebook being used to track parties and stuff. But yeah, that was you pro- just like sign in, yeah. But that was probably back in that it was all desktop. You know, was that true? Cell phone ubiquity around 2007, 2008, all of a sudden everyone's online every single moment of the day. I've been on the internet my whole life, but I, I, I remember... I'd go out to the skate park. I have no idea what's going on in the world. I have a candy bar phone. Then I'd go back home, get on the computer and see what's going on on Facebook and go, oh, how about that? Mm-hmm. Then we get, you know, with the advent of the iPhone, the, uh, the Galaxy from Android and all that stuff. Now, all of a sudden, we're online 24-7. And so one of the things I think plays a role in uh, uh, the increase in male virginity into a higher age is the expanded dating pool for younger women. So... And, and I'm not saying this is absolute. I'm saying it's, it's pro- likely a contributing factor. So you have, as, as Destiny, you, you've explained, it used to be like the in-person interactions was a large component of how we did things. You get uh, uh, a, a group of young people between the ages of 18 and 22. They're all in college. And that's their social circles. They know each other. They talk to each other. There's some expanded network because someone knows somebody went to a different school. So you might be hanging out in Chicago. And you're like, hey, there's a party near UIC. We're going to go there. Then it's like, oh, now there's a party near Loyola. Different school, different network, but people know each other. Still, however, the women and the men are all of very comparable ages. Then we get mobile apps like OkCupid and Tinder and things like this, where you get online dating. Now, those 18 to 22-year-old women in universities who normally would have a network 80% comprised of men their own age, now are on dating apps where they're getting dudes who are 30 with careers, money, convertibles, whatever you want to say. They're now in the competition with these younger guys. How is a 20-year-old guy going to compete with a 28-year-old guy? Young woman, let's say she's 20 years old. She, she has a network of, of friends. And then someone messages her on Facebook or whatever and says, hey, you want to go hang out and catch a movie later? And she goes, oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Sounds super cool. Then she's on Tinder. She gets matched with some dude who's 28, who's got, you know, makes 50, 60,000 a year. He's got a car, he's got his own apartment. He, he says, hey, what's up? You want to go to dinner and then drive down to the lake? And she's like, wow, that sounds like way more fun. How is a younger guy going to compete with that? I mean, it's hard, but there's a couple things to keep in mind. One, there's only so many older guys. You can't, there, it can't be like every older guy has like five women because they're all younger and he's dating all the age people. So one, there's only so many older guys. Two, I think to some extent this has always been kind of a problem or or that like there can be older guys i don't want to say creepy guys but they, remember the whole roy moore thing where even in, that, <laughs> even in that focus group some of the people are like i'd be honored if my 16 or 18 year old daughter was hit on by a 30 40 year old lawyer or whatever I, I the the cnn or somebody did a focus group on that some of those answers were wild um so i think to some extent that's always been a problem but here, like this is the thing i will reiterate um and it's sad because we've lost it uh, people always obsess over trying to figure out like who's fucking who, are women hypergamous, are men chasing younger women, blah, blah, blah. If you spend a lot of time in the real world and the data does bear this out, the people that date and have sex with each other are the people that are in the same space as each other. That has always been true. Yep. Co- it's funny because people online will say things like, oh, don't fuck your coworkers. Coworkers are always fucking. At every server's job, at every fucking white collar, coworkers are all in the fucking YouTube world. Coworkers are <laughs> always fucking each other. Number one, um, people that go to school are making friends, making girlfriends, boyfriends. They're always doing this. People in the same socioeconomic class, people that are similar race, people like, in general, these trends are very true. If you are in places where you're spending a lot of time around the opposite sex, you will date and you will have sex. 
like it just as a as an evolution of, of our human history that's always going to happen but if you start to remove yourself from these spaces so as young men especially if you're entering these majors where it's like 95 percent men if you're in comp sci and then from there you bounce into a job that's or if like, your socialization is online with I mean, yep, people playing video games it's mm -hmm. going to be exclusively male almost. exactly yeah if you're online you're doing heavily male majors and then when you get to your working life it's 98 percent men like you're fucked where are you going to meet women right at that point are you going to go from okay i'm logging off of league of legends today i'm going to hop on tinder when i i haven't talked to a girl in like six years because all of the majors you chose were male dominated now you're working like that you have to be in spaces with women and start to communicate with them and that's like the most important thing when it comes to determining success for dating i think to even have the opportunity to i think that's way more important than being six feet tall or going to the gym all the time or doing those other things you have to have the practice to do it you have to be in the right spaces for it to work I think Absolutely. you're right. And they've even done studies about the likelihood of relationships where you've met online versus in real life and the longevity of them. And relationships online, a lot of people have met online now and are married because it's not really a new thing. There's no stigma saying, oh, we met online. But it, there is still something different than being able to meet that person organically, spend time with them. And I think it's a lot more how our parents or grandparents used to like meet and quote like court each other um, rather than it. Online dating has almost tried to make your love life into it, it's too commoditized, I think. For a I lot think of that uh, the influence of the dad still plays into that just insofar as like, you know, if your son is terminally online and you can tell that he is sort of developing asocially, you should like interfere. But it's sort of actually like the stereotype that uh, he laid out where, you know, the dad comes home and he's just like drinking beer and kind of just like, eh, whatever, they're under my roof. It's better than what I was doing. And that is actually a real problem. Like, a, lot, a lot of parents nowadays think that because their children are under their roof. Oh, it's better than when I was a kid and I was going to parties and drinking and doing all this stuff. But then you don't know what they're doing on their phone, whether it's yes, like they're becoming yeah. autistic or they're like getting psyoped <laughs> by TikTok into becoming trans. Like this is like a very real thing that's happening. And so it was so sad too during like the summer of love in 2020. You see all these kids now exploiting like family dysfunction for clout. Like my dad won't say that George Floyd's life matters. And dad's like, how did my daughter turn out this way? And it's like, because you weren't more involved, which, yeah. you know, honestly, I would even sympathize with the idea that like the influx and proliferation of technology happened so rapidly, it's almost unfair to expect the average American male to have been able to adapt to that to save his child. But I do think there is something to be said about, okay, now that we have that, as we go into Gen Alpha, you really need to be careful with how much time your kids are spending online. The same way that now, like my generation sort of has like a micro generation, you have like first wave Zoomers, maybe like pre 9-11, and post 9-11 with how developed we are socially, you can see like with the advent of the iPhone and smartphones, there really is a cutoff. Like I don't feel like I can relate to kids five years younger than me the same way that like millennials are like, oh yeah, we're how all millennials. Old how old are Zoomers now? Uh, shoot, anywhere between like, what is it, 97 and 2005 Wait, or how old are you? 23. Jesus. <laughs> is that good or bad? I'm 34. Okay, I just didn't um, realize it. Okay. But I think you're going to see with like the the generations to follow, you're going to see that same sort of dividing line. But it's not going to be age because technology's here. It's going right. to be between the parents who didn't care, gave their kids iPads, and parents who were like, "Wait a minute, we have to go the completely opposite direction and actively monitor their child's access to technology." One thing that we've been talking about a little bit on Timcast IRL is that porn porn on uh, social media would be uh, it's it's a public space where anyone has access to, children can get on these places. The idea that people would make porn available in a public setting would be unthinkable 20 or so years ago. But for some reason, because it's the internet, we completely ignore the fact that we've made all of this accessible to children. Your kid goes to a, you know, we had a, we had a, a, a video rental store when I was a kid and they had a purple curtain and it said adult section and you could not go in there. They would not let you. You had to show an ID and then they'd let you in. And that's where all the naughty bits were. Today, a kid can just pull up their phone, go on Twitter, and there's porn everywhere, and it's like nobody cares. This is obviously going to be having, and, and it's not just about porn, it's about literally any kind of obscene, graphic, gore, shock content that children could not see before they were protected from. It seems like it's not just that these social spaces exist on social media where someone can get socialized in a very strange way or exploited by evil people, but it's also just... Even well, in, even well intentioned posting of news, right? Someone who's covering a big story and says, this is a shocking video and it's like, maybe a, a building exploding or something. Hunter Biden's cock again, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, but for real. I mean, we're talking about major politics of the Hunter Biden laptop story and a kid absolutely will at 13, if they have access to the internet and many do, they're going to see Hunter Biden in the buff. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to send it to them. Some kid in their school is going to be like, ha ha, look at this. I'm sending you Hunter Biden or whatever graphic images. This didn't happen before the internet. I'm curious, 
I, I, to a certain degree, you yeah, point, the ubiquity I'm, of it. I, I am wholly unconvinced by these arguments. I agree that like porn for kids or whatever should probably be reduced as much as you can. But like complaining about obscenity in media, I feel like that's been a trend for honestly probably since fucking greek and roman times complaining i i know they did a lot for shakespeare they complained about obscenity i know they did a lot for elvis presley they did a lot for rap music they did a lot for um you know when kids would <laughs> jerk off to girly mags or the target mag or you'd watch showtime at you know 5 a.m to see the titty come Skinamax. through whatever <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> titty come yeah yeah <laughs> yeah on the blur when the when the stars would align um yeah. I, I i think that there's something to be said that this is probably not a good thing but i think that the more important thing that I would go back to focus on is I think that the lack of socialization is the destructive aspect. I think that if you, because people will say for instance, like, oh, kids spend so much time. I, I love, wait, you're my age, right? I'm 37. Okay. Did you ever have a moment? I'm swear to God, every like millennial had this moment. If you were into games, you have a moment where your parents go to you and they say, listen, you're playing way too many computer games, way too many video games. It's not healthy. Can you like get off and like watch some TV? Never happened to me. You ne never had that happen to no, before? No. Okay. I, I I know that, I think, was it the average American family's TV consumption? It was like four to six hours a night. It was an insane amount of TV consumption. Yeah. And people would point to the internet and go like, oh, the internet's killing people. It's poisoning your minds because people are sitting in front of screens so much. We sat in front of screens a lot in the 80s, 90s too, right? People would sit in front of the screens forever. I think, again, I would like to refocus, or in my opinion, the, the dramatic change has been that even though you could engage with all those screen formed, uh, you know, forms of entertainment or jerk off to whatever mags you could find in the basement or whatever, the big thing that's changed is now we've been able to socialize online. Whereas before, um, even if I, like, I was a hardcore gamer growing up, I fucking went to sleep when I got home from school, woke up at fucking 2 a.m. to play video games and shit, I would do shit like that. But even at that, if I wanted to see my friends, I had to hop on my bike and go and, and go to my friend's house. Um, there was just no substitute for it. I couldn't do that online as much. I and I think that was a, a really, really, really big deal that we don't do things in real life anymore. I wonder if our objection to so much of the uh, internet, socialization, internet socialization, like we say, oh, this thing is shocking, this thing is shocking, is that it's fragmented. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, we everybody watched the same shows. The Simpsons would come on, Seinfeld was come on, would come on. Everybody, Star Trek was the biggest show syndicated on three networks, and there were a handful of channels. Most people didn't have cable. So The Simpsons, Thursday at you know six or whatever, everybody's watching it. Everybody gets the references. Now we have the internet where there's a whole just massive fracturing of all these different subcultures and someone is going to be socialized into a certain worldview that many other people will think is strange, obnoxious, extreme. And many of them are. And I wonder if, if that's the issue. Uh, uh, my point being, you know, when I talk about getting access to the internet and seeing weird things, it could be and probably is that people were, thought The Simpsons was was obscene. How, you know, how, they, how, course, how dare yeah. they show and these certain things? Butthead, oh, like, and butthead. Oh, definitely. Ren and Stimpy. And like, yeah. Yeah. We, and, you know, my, my mom had parental locks on the cable box when we finally got cable. So we couldn't watch Beavis and Butthead. And she would only make sure we could watch certain episodes because some of them were too, were, were too, were, were, were really bad. So I, I had parents who did that. That being said, it's a lot harder to control what your kids are seeing because of the ease of access to the internet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I a lot of these two-year-olds uh, are more sophisticated with their iPads than the fucking parents are. Yep. <laughs> That's why, too. Yeah, sorry, God. The, um, you know, the category of obscenity, I think, is true, and you can find, like, this throughout history. Uh, but I think that, like, parents being offended by The Simpsons or, like, a Slayer album is definitely different than, you know, like, the hardcore pornography that any person with an iPhone or any internet access can just access, like, immediately. Um, I think that has done something to the human brain, the male brain in particular, especially when they're young and your brain is, like, in its most plastic form. I mean, we know that it reduces gray matter. We know it affects the way that, like, neural paths ways are formed especially in regards to like your socialization your attraction it can literally like warp your sexuality in general um, which is why you see a lot of people who you know they get addicted to certain types of pornography and then all of a sudden they want to wave different kinds of flags and it's like okay i think we kind of know they get ed what, yeah no yeah, that's real crazy. there's been like a thousand yeah. percent increase in the last 15 Erectile years dysfunction. because of things like pornography and so i think even if you would have showed like you know the parents in say 1989 or whenever the simpsons came out like hey homer simpson he's crude but 30 years from now, your child is going to have this device and it's going to be able to do this. They'd be like, okay, I'll take the Simpsons. That's fine. Like they definitely would have understood the degrees and probably would have been more willing to draw like a practical line. And like you said too, I mean, any child can access this. And so a lot of parents, like when I speak about this issue on my channel, They'll be like, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter. Just be a good parent. And it's like, it's not enough to just be a good parent. I mean, if your child has internet access and they're 13 years old, 
they're going to find it just because that's like the nature of the child. So you have to be more proactive as a parent to shield them because it's everywhere. It's on social media. And if not even explicitly on social media, it's like a thirst trap. It's like some TikTok girl who's going to try to like, you know, sigh up your kid into like, oh, where's this video from? Then he looks it up anyways. Well, it's funny. I, last night we were talking about the whole pornography online thing. And I was reading the comments and a lot of them were like, oh, Tim, you're all about personal responsibility, but you want other people to raise your kids. It's not really about that. I mean, we're talking about how all of these different subcultures that have kind of become radicalized because they've been segregated. Yeah, it's it's bad for children and the way they're socialized, but it's also not good for adults. So I think more broadly, the reason why thirst traps aren't good is not just because a kid could be on there, but I think it's also not good even if, if you're an adult, if you're a single man. I don't think it's a healthy way to be interacting with women solely. Like if you're not seeing them on your day to day and actually forming relationships, interpersonal ones, platonic ones with women, and your only exposure to women is through a sexualized lens, I don't think that's healthy. I think I, that's super true. If you if you interact with enough of a certain type of person, I think it immune, uh, immunizes you against a lot of like the negative or more precarious stereotypes you might see. So if you interact right. with black yeah. people, you're, you're not gonna come away listening to a rap song like every black person is a criminal. Or if you interact with women in real life, you're not gonna come away thinking like every woman wants to have her face slapped while she's getting bukkakied by 20, you know, BBCs <laughs> or whatever, right? That was right. Yeah, having, the, having, the, yeah. having the actual like real life interactions, right. I can, cons can serve as a I good was, countering effect to things you see online, yeah. I thought you were gonna say something like, if you interact with women, you realize they're not all gold diggers or something, but you know, your analogy works too. Thanks. Well, we're uh, talking about relationships and porn, so, you know. It's true. I, I do have, I have good news and bad news for the conservatives. Uh, first, the good news. Uh, the good news is OnlyFans cannot survive. O OnlyFans inevitably will cease to exist as this hub for, for women to post images of themselves in exchange for money. Uh, the bad news is the reason why. It's going to be other dudes using AI to make graphic images to sell to other guys. And that's going to shove women out of the pornography market because uh, it's already starting to happen. But as okay, as a woman, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around something like AI pornography. Wouldn't part of the appeal of pornography be that it is a real person? I think even too, it's like with OnlyFans in particular, like a lot of boomers who don't get it. Not that I get it, but they're like, you know, why don't you just go watch like, you know, regular porn? It's like the parasocial aspect like guys like you know talking to her and this probably will be another guy too maybe it'll literally yeah. be like an ai model and then some indian guy's gonna be like oh how was your day <laughs> yeah. doing the talking they like you know feeling like i'm supporting this girl this, i'm talking to her this is what's already happening and it's crazy people are using ai to generate women and to create instagram profiles where they automatically upload ai generated images and dudes are buying into it fuck there was a girl that i was talking to for like two or three days on instagram and for i i talked to a few people and i um and i ended up clicking through her profile because i was curious when i started looking at pictures close and i realized wait a second they got yeah. you <laughs> this, is a, this is a fucking ai generated i absolutely yep. can tell i was like fuck so, so yeah that is absolutely happening and you mentioned isn't part of the appeal that it's a real person not if you are someone who is hyper online playing world of warcraft all day and you're into like elves and furries or something, you're going to want to watch, you're, you're, you're going to have some weird fetish for things that don't exist in the real world. This is why uh, erectile dysfunction is on the rise because dudes are getting hyper, uh, uh, what, I don't even know what the right word is. Desensitized? They're, yeah, yep. like, and, and, and they're watching weird things and developing weird paraphilias or fetishes to where like, look, yo, there's Simpsons porn. It's like rule 34, like it, if it exists, there is porn of it. So, Guys aren't attracted to regular women. They want the AI generated weird stuff. I think that's still a niche in terms of because the vast majority of porn is still like real people, but yeah. hentai and 3D porn and shit does exist. I think there is an aspect where you want a real person, but I think that real person is actually a stand in for something that looks convincingly real. We just haven't gotten that in our minds yet. Here's like a prediction that I make. And I actually, I made this prediction that I, when I looked and I saw that parts of this already come true. The idea of having like an AI girlfriend, have you ever seen the movie Her? Yes, great movie. Not. Okay, the idea of having an AI girlfriend on his face seems absurd. And even when you think about it a little bit more, it seems even more absurd. But I genuinely feel that if you could flip a switch to where these conversations got good enough, I actually think there would be like a huge cascading effect where people are like, this is actually, I, I want this. Um, there's a there's a program called, I don't want to shout it out, I guess, because now I'm worried about people finding it out. Uh, but I, I did some searching. I found one where you can have like AI girlfriends and stuff and watching these forums, whenever they do like a software update and people are like, my person's not talking to me the same anymore. This is the saddest of my life. Whoa. Or like my wife died and now like my person doesn't even treat me the same because of this like patches or a way that I can roll them back. It's like oh, man. hyper obsessive stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like insane. Yeah. There's a, there's a movie I I was talking about last night called Simulant. And uh, it's got uh, Sima, we, we talked about Simu Liu. Simu Liu, does that pronounce the name? Uh, it's about, there are AI uh, robots of people. Mm -hmm. This man and this woman, spoiler alert, I guess, if you want to see the movie, I don't know, spoiler. 
uh, they get AI ver robot versions of themselves made in the event one of them dies and they download their memories into it. Guy dies in a car accident. She activates the robot, gets super creeped out by it because it's not him and it's like a facsimile and she has absolute authority over it. So it's a just completely different social dynamic. But I actually feel that, that there is a strong possibility for that in, in robotics, at least. The mind of the AI is, is being formed. The body, far further behind. You know, you, you have blow up dolls, you have real girls or whatever they're called, the real dolls or whatever they're called, and you have robotics uh, uh, being developed. I think that's far further behind where chat, like chat bots and language stuff is a lot easier for us to do than to mm -hmm. build a full functioning robot that can be a wife or a husband or something. But I feel like given the opportunity, people are going to choose that. They're going to choose the perfect ideal, be whatever you want. Which is not a good thing because... In a healthy relationship, you're going to have uh, someone who actually cares about you, genuinely cares about you. They're going to call you out when you're going down the wrong path, when you're doing something that's bad for you. That's someone who actually loves you. But if you're only forming relationships with AI girlfriend chatbots, they're going to they're not going to do that because the incentive is just to keep you coming back and keep you paying the subscription mall or anything. So you're a lot of young men are going to be led down very dark paths because in a healthy relationship, the other person their only concern shouldn't just be to keep you happy and keep you logging on like it would be with an AI. Here's the thing about the AI girlfriend that you need to need to imagine. You have these chat bots like like her, for instance, is a good example. I didn't see it, but I, I think the premise was that her was dating everybody or something like that. Like everybody. Had That's had how it kind of evolves. But she starts off as just his like his version of a Siri yeah. who is AI. And then it kind of devolves into something. Imagine really a gigantic demonic octopus. <laughs> And all of its tentacles are reaching out and each tentacle has a mask on it. And, and people are talking to one mask like, what a great person. And it's actually this gigantic mass. The AI is one system acting like individuals that is, that is horrifying. And everyone's just like staring at it like, oh, AI girlfriend, it's so good. That creeps me out. There's actually a Futurama uh, movie. Oh, yes. Beast right. Made a Billion Bucks, yeah. Yep, yep. So let's 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 do this. I have this tweet from Adam 22 because this was big in the news and everybody was ragging on this guy. And I, you can't say he's not funny. Uh, they're calling him a cuck. And I guess it's because his wife uh, slept with another guy. He posted this image, said, why do people keep tweeting this at me? I don't get it. And it's a woman pregnant with a black baby and a man smiling and putting his hands on the woman's uh, stomach. So I'm interested in, uh, uh, you know, as we move the conversation for, forward, the discussion in, uh, into monogamy, you mentioned earlier, if everybody was in an open relationship, there would be no infidelity. So Which I'm, was, by the way, that was a joke, but yeah. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it, the, the, here's the idea. I mean, we're seeing a lot of this rise up, polycules, uh, this guy uh, being called a cuck because his wife, I guess, what is what is she did? What, what, what Isn't was that story? literally cuckoldry? Like, it's not just he's being called when that would make him. No, one. no. I think a cuckoldry is a fetish where you like watching your wife get get banged. Right? Is that what it is? Traditionally, it generally involves some aspect of humiliation. But some huh. people cuck cuck hunting has become like the most obsessive like projection of insecurity. Like that everybody in the red pill and larger space on the internet where people are, like obsessed with like finding cucks and seeing cucks and calling people cucks. <laughs> Like, like if your girlfriend cuck, fucked too many guys shit. in the past, you're eternally being cucked. Um, sometimes if you're a dad, having a daughter can make you a cuck because you're just <laughs> training her to get fucked by another guy. Like every the cuck hunting wow. shit is like an insane level that. of projection of insecurity. Today. But the word uh, it does go back, you know, hundreds of years in the English tradition, and it's not just a guy who has cheated on. Like you know, if you come home and your wife's banging another guy. Guys, unfortunately, would be like, you're a cuck. But traditionally, what it means is the guy who is like rationalizing it. Someone like Adam22, who's like, yeah, my wife is sleeping with other guys, but it's okay because uh, I'm making money on it and I'm going to tweet this funny meme and it's going to go viral and people are going to subscribe to the OnlyFans for $5 a month or something like that. Didn't this, wasn't, wasn't this something with uh, Hunter Avalon as well? I don't oh, know. I don't, yeah. That gets a lot messier, but yeah. we love Hunter. Oh, a lot messier. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, Hunter. I don't really care about the, the personal drama. And, mm. you know, my attitude is like, dude, I really don't care what this Adam guy is doing. I don't care what his relationship or his, 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 what he, what he likes and what he doesn't like, what he wants his wife to do or not do. But I, I do think, think it's interesting, and, and this is a big culture war debate, honor and shame around whether or not you're in an open relationship or a monog monogamous relationship, whether or not you are emasculated because your wife has sex with other men. Personally, not my cup of tea. I, I, like, I prefer monogamy. Yeah, I, I, I'm not interested in any of that stuff. I also just don't care what other people do. So the question is, is it bad for society? Is it in some way emasculating? Uh, what do you guys think? 
I mean, is it is it bad for society? I don't know if that's... I think it would probably is best for people to be able to pick their own relationship styles and sort themselves out that way. Like, 50% of marriages ending in divorce is probably bad for society, right? If yeah. those people would have been better off in some other situation in terms of relationship style, it'd probably be better for society. Um, would it be better? Are, are those our choices, though? Either either 50% of marriages are ending in divorce or people just have open relationships? Because all of this is very new. So I think a lot of people act as if, well, it's either it's either polyamory or divorce. It's all, well, sure. a, a lot of human history kind of bears that. That perhaps there, yeah, it I'm not saying I'm way. not saying that it has to be one or the other. I'm just saying that railroading everyone into monogamous relationships is probably not. The, that's definitely not the best idea. Railroading everybody to that with the divorce rate of what it is now, that's not working. Um, I'm not saying that like it needs to be everybody has to be polyamorous or open or whatever because I don't even think the majority. I don't even think a, a, a plurality of people can handle those types of relationship styles. Um, but yeah, th I think that letting people. I think the important thing is you let people explore. You let people figure out what they want. Some people try some things they don't like it. They try other things. That's fine. Um, but I think that it's important to I would say like give people the the freedom. To to explore um if you don't like a certain relationship style i think that's fine i don't think it's bad if a person wants to be monogamous or they want to be polyamorous or um open or whatever but i think it's weird that sometimes people obsess over and meet watch other people's relationship styles so much like i like there are people i think it's totally fair to look at adam 22 situation i mean they do both do porn so it's like a that's already like out there but like to look at his situation like i don't think i would ever do that i don't i wouldn't want that i think that's totally fine it gets really weird how obsessive people are over like the dicks and pussies of people that they don't like though I think that's kind of weird. But. Well, I, it's weird to obsess over individuals that you don't know and their relationships. But I think more broadly, if we are talking about on a societal level, we know the best environment to raise kids in. And so I don't think it's just being authoritarian for people to say, this is probably not a good trend that we're heading in. And therefore, even if I don't care about what this individual guy does, this is still not a, not something we should be embracing. We should be criticizing it because this does have societal effects. This does affect the lives of children who aren't going to grow up in stable homes where, but with both a mother and a father because these relationships, I think, are naturally going to be volatile. So I think we, we there is a good reason for us to criticize it. Sure, but I mean, like, I mean, one, the, the best, I'm pretty sure, statistically speaking, the best household to raise kids is two gay parents. So, like, already, like, this is... Based on, right? based on what? Is that real? Because, I think it's because gay parents um, have to jump through a few more hoops when it comes to adoption. What are so, gay parents? What is that? It's a man and a man. How does that work? So you're saying, but, parents. But, they, well, it's called adoption. That doesn't make you a parent necessarily. If you're two men and you like adopt a child, uh, is this the next Matt Walsh thing? documentary? What is a parent? <laughs> 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 I mean, you don't call it as parent. I'm just saying that the style of household, like obviously a broken household, the traditional broken household, I think we all agree is horrible for children. So man abandons mom, no child support. Mom has to work and fend for herself and take care of the kid and is usually in a shitty neighborhood. That's the worst outcome. I think we all agree with that. Yes. But then like, again, if you got the 50% of marriages ending divorced, you've got like all sorts of problems relating to like only half of women even get their full child support and everything. That style is not working right now. But so that style is not monogamy. Like that's not traditional monogamy. What we have with no-fault divorce that's kind of exploded, that's representative of the monogamous and marriage lifestyle now. But historically, that has not been the case. So, I mean, I think there's grounds for also bringing in the question of divorce into all of this. We're too keen uh, to, I guess, and obviously I'm not talking about, Oh, your husband beats you. What was that? Whatever clip. Indoor. Like that's not what I'm. I'll take you better for that. Yeah, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> was that you? Yeah. Well, oh, no, on. I wasn't the one that said indoor. That was our friend. Uh, <laughs> that was our friend MLD. What I Jeez. said was, and, and Destiny understands this as a former Catholic. Is um, his wife brought up divorce, and I said, you know, I don't believe in divorce. It's not a real. I thing. I was married in the Catholic Church and, too, so I know that that's it's off the table. Yeah. So I meant that in like a very sort of like metaphysical sense. I didn't mean like literally like you know separate. And so later on, I did say. Like in that same monologue, like, yeah, obviously separate, get yourself out of that situation. Destiny's wife clipped that out. I understand. You got to play the game. That's fine. I'm not mad. To be fair, you said, didn't you say divorce should be illegal? I mean, well, that's probably true as well. But like <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> a separate top conversation. But she is right that, you know, with things like no fault divorce, as that started to be integrated throughout the country, you saw states that were passing these laws had couples reporting like increased likelihood of considering that as even an option. So I think the like virtue and nobility of marriage is like you're in this for the long haul. There is no way out. And so you find find a way to make it work and it's kind of like with abortion we're like well if i know that like worst case scenario i can get divorced i can just kill the kid that tends to happen more often because people just don't commit i was going to say too uh, your point about raising kids in the in the a better household or what we know is good for kids i think it's fair to say that there is an overlap between the people who are more likely to abort their kids and people who are likely to be in open relationships right conservatives more likely to be monogamous less likely to get an abortion so a lot of these these uh dating preferences that involve multiple people or things like that, less likely to result in having kids. I mean, 
I don't think that's necessarily the case. We could say maybe less likely, but ultimately there are going to be kids in situations like this. Of course. And likelihood of abuse when you have a non-biologically related father in, in a household, it, it skyrockets. And that's just talking about the extreme case, extreme case of abuse, not even to mention just general socialization and stuff like that. So I think this is not a good trend. It's not healthy for society. Does that mean that we should find where this Adam-22 guy lives and kind of tar and feather him? No, but we should absolutely be able to say... This is not where we want to be going. As I, I, I do want to ask you a follow-up too. You mentioned gay parents are traditional. Are, 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 I think they score the best in outcomes because of but, the hoops they have to jump through for adoption. My question was: Does that exclude lesbian parents? I think it's only for gay parents are the ones I've seen it. The red pill people would. Okay, yeah, yeah that's what, what red pill okay. people might say. I'm it's sorry. just two fathers even better. The lesbians they like beat the crap out <laughs> of each other. Tower. The ultimate evolution of red pill is going to be guys just realizing that being gay is better. Have sex with your homies. Improve each other's businesses. Like, don't deal with crazy fucking women. No periods. No pregnancies. Like it's just it's ultra just the best ultra McDowell. Yeah, exactly. Just, yeah. just dudes being bros. And nothing else. True. Well, women I made, exist for social credit only. Okay? Well, I, I made that joke because there's been this thing going around about males breastfeeding, uh, trans women inducing lactation to breastfeed babies. And so my joke was that now that we, we we've grown a, a sheep in a bag, they have this bag. They put the sheep in it and they it grew. And so it's like, if we can grow babies in pods, like, you're, you, have you guys seen that commercial that went viral where it was like in the future and it shows all these pods with the babies in it? What do you need women for? The dudes can breastfeed. The pods can grow the babies. It'll just be a bunch of dudes hanging out, drinking beers, banging each other. They don't need women for anything. Based. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's weird. Um, yeah. It is, but it, 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 it is. Absolutely. I mean, uh, th there's a lot to break down in that, like growing babies in test tubes. Does it kind of feel like, I shouldn't say test tubes, but you know, in pods, like, does it seem like that's where we're going? That's absolutely Probably, where yeah. we're going. We're already commoditizing birth with things like surrogacy. Yep. So I, I don't think test tubes is that far. And I think the most dystopian part of that would be babies being sold and bought as commodities, which isn't dependent on the test tube that's happening right now. Yeah, I think that we've become much more degenerate and general as a society, especially in terms of relationships. Like people aren't raised to be husbands or wives. People aren't taught about these virtues that are important for, you know, being in a successful monogamous relationship. Um, you know, I've gone to many relatives like 50th wedding anniversary parties. Yeah, they'll make jokes about like, oh, I hate my wife. It's just sort of like a time timely thing, I guess. But ultimately, they have like very successful marriages. Um, and I think that as we've sort of moved away from those things, you're seeing more problems. The divorce rate is higher. People are exploring alternatives. But I don't think it's better. I don't think the answer to not doing marriage correctly because you weren't ready for that responsibility is to abandon the idea of monogamy and then try to pursue something like an open relationship, which for some people it does work. I'm not going to like a lot of the trad cats want to like look at Destiny and be like, he's miserable with his like Aryan snow princess wife and millions of dollars. I'm not going to make that argument for some people. <laughs> it does work. The problem is. I feel an obligation as someone with an audience to shame that type of relationship because it cannot be normalized within the consciousness of the masses as an alternative. We must pursue what is right and true. And if some people want to deviate, that's fine. We'll round them up later. But for the time <laughs> being, we have to pursue what we know works. And I just don't think these alternate models work, let alone at a mass scale. Right. They're, and I think there's a good uh, there's a good point to be made there. We can talk about something not working because the actual outcomes are just not practical, not pragmatic. But there's also the question that's kind of separate of, is it in line with I guess what is true and just, which is something that I think Christians have started falling off with completely. And you mentioned the whole gay parent thing. I don't think we do enough shaming of how like straight couples ruined marriage before gays even got into it. That's real. <laughs> true. No Where did all these with. open relationship poly people come from? Yeah. They came from monogamous relationships. That's yeah. the problem. See, you, so clearly it's not the superior relationship. Do you remember style. when uh, Chelsea Handler had that viral video? See, this is the silly thing, you know, in culture war politics. I got I got roped into criticism. So, you know, Ben Shapiro, a handful of other people are like, Chelsea Handler is miserable. She's got no kids in her life and she's single. I never said that, but they acted like I did. I, Chelsea Handler made that video where she says she wakes up in the morning, does drugs and masturbates. And I said, that woman is probably happier than a pig in shit. She's like doing whatever she wants. She's rich. I don't, I don't see her as being unhappy. I think a lot of this is projection from people who think that lifestyle is a net detriment 
need them to be unhappy. Yes. This is something I try to communicate to people, and it's impossible. I don't know if it comes with age or experience or what, but um, one of the most detrimental things that you can operate through in life is that there's some sort of like karmic balance that that guy that bullied you in high school, he's going to grow up and he's going to be fucking miserable. I know. But <laughs> he might not be. He might yeah. have a dad that owns a business, yep. and he might not only not only might he not be miserable, he might be super happy. He might realize what he did was wrong. He might live a more virtuous and better life than you ever will. There yeah. are people that are truly shitty people that are happy and have fun and do good and they learn from the mistakes this running around in the world and operating under this assumption that like that guy this is why the cuck hunting stuff is so fun to me is these people a lot of them virgins a lot of them miserable for a lot of reasons so why they consume all of this content will be on twitter tweeting it like adam 22 or me like i know fucking miserable you fucking are because if i if you fucking ever do this shit and it's like bro are you okay like healthy people don't spend people draw so many i've got so much fan art of me watching my wife fucking some black dude and i'm like bro there's no way that a healthy guy is drawing <laughs> this picture time. yeah it, the whole time like thinking about, like oh i know this is gonna fucking trigger the fuck out of him uh, like dude <laughs> that's kind of like what we were talking about earlier picture. like yeah it is like jesus of the appeal of that whole genre of content is like that guy just like stacy's gonna be miserable she's gonna hit yeah. the yeah. wall yeah, yeah. And just, like, you've got like some guys like don't worry, little bro. I've got the suit. I've got the watch. Shut up, bitch. And he's like, yeah, get her. <laughs> I think I think for a lot of uh, conservatives, the reason why they would say Chelsea Handler is miserable, miserable actually stems from the conservative view that society would improve or be better with stable relationships where kids are raised by a mother and not, a father. Not just that, but it's also the conservative view that something that is, I guess, in terms of your sensories, uh, sensory, uh, your senses, uh, something that is good and pleasurable that is not necessarily the highest end we are not put on this earth i don't know the meaning of life for me is not just to pursue hedonistic ends so chelsea handler she has drugs and a, a big house that's nice but is there actual like further li lifelong joy in that or is she just kind of having having fun They're, those things are not the same and i think conservatives don't do a good job articulating that because obviously she's a millionaire she's having a good time but does that bring her deeper meaning yeah uh, th th this is the scary thing about uh, short-sightedness of the conservative position in saying that like destiny would be unhappy or chelsea handler would be unhappy the problem we don't we don't take the time to define what happiness is well but i think the 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 fear that i have is we would be too happy you know, uh, uh, there's this, this quote I read a long time ago when I was reading about uh, Fermi's paradox. And uh, some scientist guy, you, you guys probably find the quote, he said, if humans ever, you know, greet and shake hands with aliens, it will be not to celebrate overcoming nuclear weapons, but because we overcame the Xbox. In that humans are, uh, for whatever reason, being driven towards pleasurable outcomes. It's like the experiment we did with the mice where we put the electrode in the brain to stimulate dopamine, like you mentioned mm -hmm. the other night. The rat or the mouse would just keep spamming the button because it feels good. And that's what we're doing. So I think when conservatives come out and they say, Chelsea Handler is miserable. I'm like, no way, dude. She's happier than someone's probably ever been. And that actually is the issue. No, but that she's not happier than someone who could ever be. She's having more fun, but that's not the same. And she's, I, think I, I, I disagree. I think yeah, she's, no, that she's is stimulating dopamine to what, the extreme degree. What Lauren is getting at is, and it's a really good point, but people don't talk about it because they're too busy tearing down other things than making good arguments for your own things. There's a difference between happiness and fulfillment. Right? Yes, yeah. Happiness is scrolling TikTok for 12 hours. Fulfillment is spending 12 hours reading a book and finishing it, right? There's a there's a marked difference in the body, the way that it affects your uh, psychology, the way that it impacts the way you move through life, because people that are more willing to endure some fiction to reach some fulfillment are probably going to have holistically a better outcome. But I, yeah, but I, when I people agree. spend all their time shitting on other people's happiness, it's like it doesn't seem like you're advocating very well for your lifestyle, yeah. So, so I guess the better way to frame it is short-term happiness is v versus long-term happiness in that you're right. You know, someone who has a family and kids and is, you know, they're, they're older and they can see all their grandkids and they see everything they've done is going to have this, this like profound, like, wow. And somebody who just did drugs and masturbated all day is going to be older and be like, well, you know, I can do that again. Mm -hmm. I guess the difference is if you exercise every day and eat healthy, you're going to feel really, really good. Yeah. But when you're, when you're sitting in that moment, eating a chocolate fudge sundae, you feel really good right now. And yeah, so having that balance is important. There's a difficult thing striking that balance too. I remember I got into an argument with one guy. This was like four or five years ago. We were arguing about investing money. Um, I think it was another content creator. And this guy fucking, this guy blew every fucking dollar that he had. And I remember talking to him. It was like, our jobs are like pretty like transitory like i don't know how long i'm gonna be doing this aren't you scared that you're like wasting all of your money right now like you don't invest anything and the guy's like well aren't you scared that you won't get to have fun to spend any money until you're 45 
And I was like, fuck, I guess maybe. <laughs> Damn, I didn't think about it that way. And he's like, yeah, you know, like I might have some fucky shit when I'm like 40 and 50 and 60 or whatever, but like I'm in my 20s right now. I want to have a lot of fucking fun. And I think the memories I'm making right now are really cool and I want to do that. I'm like, okay. And I'm not, now I'm not advocating that you should spend all of your money today, accumulate a ton of debt, and then live on Social Security or be fucked for the rest of your life. <laughs> but I, I mean, like, there is something to be said for striking a balance. It can't be all arduous, suffering, vegetarian, gym every day, no fun whatsoever for your life. Like you have to find a way to balance the happiness and the fulfillment at the same time. I, I do think that uh, there is a high likelihood that the modern culture around, you know, free sex, do whatever you want, you know, very short term thinking is going to result in a lot of unhappy people. I think we're actually seeing it already in that many millennials and younger have little to no skill. And so you've got people who are struggling to find work, don't have no fulfillment. They have they feel like they have no purpose. That's terrifying when you think about where that where that goes in 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. I, I but I wonder, I wonder because people's perspectives change. But when you look at that that common trope of nobody on their deathbed ever said I wish I worked more. You know, everyone's always like where's my family and stuff. There's going to be a lot of people. I was talking about this with Chelsea Handler. This was my criticism of her was it was not that she was unhappy. I don't think she's unhappy. I think she's very happy. However, me personally, based on my worldview, I imagine her 68, 70 years old in a cold and sterile hospital bed suffering from some ailment. And the doctor comes in with a chart and says, you know, Ms. Handler, it is terminal. Is there anyone we should call? And she just sits there and says, no. And they say, okay, well, we are press the button if you need us. And they walk out and then she just sits there. Yeah. That that is a, that is that is that is hell in my view. That is a nightmare scenario to me. I'm not saying it's absolutely will happen to her. She maybe has friends. However, what I've learned from older people, the scariest thing I've heard from older people, I remember. Uh, let me tell you a story. I was in Chicago. I was 18. I was skateboarding. I went and got some pizza. I had some leftovers. I see a, a homeless old black man hanging out, smoking a cigarette, and I'm like, "Hey, my man, you, you want some pizza?" And he's like, "Yeah, hell yeah, brother." And I walk over, and I was like, "Can I ask you a question?" I was like, "Are you homeless?" And he's like, I said, I am. And I said, how did that happen? The story told me was that he worked at the post office for most of his life. And uh, he got older. His friends and family had died. He was, he, was, he was unmarried. He had an apartment. You know, once he gets into his like mid to late 60s, he doesn't really have any friends anymore. And then they laid him off. His money started to run, unemployment at first, starts to run out of money. Eventually he can't afford to pay his, his bills anymore, gets evicted. He has no one to call, no one to turn to. So now he lives on the streets. And I'm like, damn, that's that's terrifying. No, and so yeah. my fear is for someone like Chelsea Handler, I don't care what she does. She can live however she wants to live. But I do believe that there's a high likelihood that people like her will find themselves in what the average person would describe as a nightmare scenario of no one cares about you. No one knows where you are and you die alone. Yeah. Well, and, and there's no way that she atomized. hasn't thought about that, too. I mean, she definitely hasn't. I, I know a lot of people who have meaningful lives and they accent them with things that, you know, maybe the right would be like, oh, this is degenerate. There's no way you're happy. But it's like, you know, they have their accomplishments. They have their empire, whatever it may be. But someone in that position, I don't even know who Chelsea Handler is, uh, but I imagine this is a famous person who has been successful, maybe has passed their prime or something. And so they're going to make a video like, oh, look at I, all I do is masturbate and smoke weed all day. I don't believe that that is possible to even achieve happiness longer than a week. If you wake up and all you do is smoke weed and masturbate, you're literally biologically eroding your capacity to feel that euphoria that you are now drawn to through your dopamine receptors because that diminishes over time, which is literally your brain trying to like save you from that binging mechanism. And I think a lot of people who are parents they were responding to Chelsea Handler saying because her whole thing was like I, I'm still happy even though I'm unmarried and single I can go to Paris and do all these things and it's like Chelsea you are how old is she? She's 50 years old like you easily could have kids who are now adults and still be doing all of the things that you're doing we're so obsessed with immediate gratification I feel like especially millennials we have this idea where if you're a parent it's like you have a newborn strapped to you always for the rest of your life which is just not what parenthood is like kids grow up they go yeah. through different phases you're not going to be up sleepless nights forever and two they would have to explain then why and this isn't everything but it's not nothing the profile of the person who is the statistically most likely to be depressed in this country is the middle-aged single childless working woman so if it were really a lifestyle that not only works but is ideal and liberating then then why is that the result then that we're i don't seeing? know so one i don't know if that's true but also if we, if we want to go by stats isn't the most likely to kill themselves like the middle-aged um, white yes. man yeah, experiencing who, depression whose family is already are, left out like are different yeah. between men and women though I, I think it's important to to figure out like what is it in life that brings you happiness what is it in life that fulfills you fulfills you and then kind of like move in that direction like 
in some ways, I feel like Chelsea Handler is a good example of, you know, maybe we look at her like, oh, she's not going to find much fulfillment. She's going to like this, blah, 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 blah. But like, do you think she would have been a good parent? <laughs> maybe it's better that people like that don't have kids. Right? Yeah, no, if they I, really don't want to, if they really feel like they would have been burdened. Yeah, go ahead. Great point. I think we can have both of that. We could say like having this uh, hedonistic, excessive, very materialistic lifestyle, it's not going to lead to fulfillment, but also we should examine why someone like that exists in the first place so it's, it's it's a societal problem as much as it is a personal problem i think um to destiny's point i think that men and women experience depression a lot differently i think that women experience depression um in a much more environmental sense like if they are in an environment that they are not happy with they're not enjoying they will feel depressed when men experience depression i think it's much more that they see no way out of that environment which is why i think too like you know it's common that we say women are more likely to attempt suicide men are more likely to actually commit suicide because women will be you know maybe in a low emotional state and they'll just kind of lash out and like try to hurt themselves but men will be like okay i have done the math this is not going to work out and they'll just like blow their head off with a shotgun and i think that's because like this whole society that we've cultivated doesn't allow for avenues for people to pursue meaning the way that they would have even in their grandparents generation i mean you know boomers don't like this but it is true that like on a single income you could get a nice house in a safe neighborhood you could get a moral spouse didn't have to worry about them being like you know some red pill guy didn't have to worry about them being like an only fans thought they were just more or less normal people and you could have that you know summer home a boat cars without going into the debt that you have to now without having to deal with this sort of like societal disintegration that our generations are having to deal with that does weigh on people and i don't think that there's even a way out of that but we seem to be distracting from that reality that we all know with things like you know the hedonism and the endless pursuit of pleasure this sort of like narcissism uh that we see with like i'm not gonna have kids ew i'm just gonna go like travel and smoke weed and do whatever and it's like ultimately there's gonna reach a point where these people realize that that is not going to you know, make them happy. And especially women, when they're past the point where they can have kids, they are going to snap. Sure. And I am genuinely afraid of what that's going to do to society. <sighs> okay, here's where I'm going to go my atheist rant, though. And I'm going to shut on it. Both you guys are religious, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> this is my, uh, okay. I feel like we haven't been bringing up religion that much. No, that's that's why I said I'm about to. Okay. okay. I this thought is, we were we were like go, being too Christian for people. I thought like, oh, we were, look at us moderates. Okay, don't worry. We'll bring the atheism in here. This is why Christianity sucks, and it's why all the Christian talking points suck. The... Few, the, the world today as it exists is different than it ever has been. We have to find a way to offer people some avenue for fulfillment that doesn't require us resetting the clock 30, 40, 50, 100 years on civilization. This is why I'll always fight with Christians or red pills or whatever, people that are like, you know, we need to get rid of the pill or birth control. That's never happening. Women need to go back to the home and need to stop working so much. That's never happening. These are two of probably the most massive things that have changed society. And these are two of the things that I hear people complain about the most, that women are being too masculinized, that women can sleep around now and they don't have to get married, blah, blah, blah. These are two things that are never changing. Whatever solution we're offering men or people in general in the world going forward, I don't think it can be like a return to tradition where we go back to the way things were 100 years ago because that's never How does that happen. relate to Christianity and atheism though? Because when I hear people, because I think that the world today has become a bit more secular in terms of how we look for or happiness and fulfillment and I think that Christians like to fall back a lot on like well the Bible is all the answers you need all of your metaphysical all of your ethical all of your ep epistemic truths can be found in the Bible we just have to go back to church after that and I feel like overall like the traditional lifestyle I think for a long time people assumed that that traditional lifestyle we're just biologically inclined towards it women want to have kids men want to be fathers and it's like well put in a society with birth control and jobs people actually are making way different choices than we ever thought they would before so it seems like that biological drive is not as strong as it was the religion religion aspect is probably not coming back. So I think we have to have better answers for going forward in the future, other than just like we need to be trad con or we need to, you know, bring God back into the world or whatever. It has to be different. Right? Even to what you said, like, oh, like it's hard to afford things today. You could have like a, a boat house or, or, or a boat and a, a house on the waterfront and blah, blah, blah with a single income. Yeah, but the world was a lot different back then too. You didn't have the huge cities we have today. You didn't have all the opportunities that exist in those cities. You didn't have cell phones or the internet. You didn't have video games. Like they had access to like property, but like what they could do with those properties and the opportunity and everything available to them was also so way, 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 way less. I think the, the biological drives remain. They just may be channeled in different ways. Like men aren't exactly like going to war the way we used to, but we spend a lot of time watching other men fight or compete in, you know, grand athletic displays or things like that. Or even women, for example. Yeah, they're not having children maybe as much as they used to. But even you see in the trends on social media, like, you know, the feminine urge to do this. I mean, there's a reason those things go viral. It does reminate or resonate to some degree with women, even if it's not possible. And I also think it's true that women are far more susceptible to like social pressures. Yes. And if every institution and person in the media is telling them like this is lame you need to go be like you know what's her face they're gonna be like oh okay like they think it's a low status opinion to want to pursue motherhood and they're actually shamed for that more so than they would have been when they were being taught to do that yeah i suppose if, if the argument is that women are more agreeable 
and you're seeing algorithms promoting, wh whether they know it's the algorithm or not, but the content that gets promoted consistently says live this way, and this particular lifestyle results in a higher rate of depression. I think that's a bad thing. I also think it's a massive, uh, massive issue that has so many variables as it would be impossible to track what is actually causing all, all of this stuff. You know, like yeah. what's 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 causing the increase in depression? Conservatives are going to take a conservative view and say if women were doing, you know, more of this. Liberals are going to are going to take the inverted view and say depression's high because women are being suppressed. You get my point? Like, yeah. finding yeah. out what the actual data point is would be very difficult. And on the biblical point too, I mean, we're not really supposed to be of this earth. I mean, you know, our time here is very limited, and we're going to spend most of our time either in heaven or hell by far. And so, you know, the Bible doesn't necessarily have to conform to the standards of the world, but vice versa. And so, if the Bible is telling you you need to be chaste and disciplined and temperate and prudent things like that, I mean, those virtues are literally timeless. I mean, you can apply those virtues even if maybe it's more difficult now to you know be held to those standards than when the, the society was less obviously satanic it still is true that if you look at the bible as like a, a almost like a we'll use <laughs> like a game guide for how to exist well, in the, the world the, the meme is like basic instructions before leaving earth yeah bible no, nobody was ever like if you actually like laid out everything in the bible that it says don't do this and you followed that for say a year or something you're not going to be able to tell me that your life would be worse it would obviously be so much better because it's true and it's real and i don't know anybody who's like well, miserable right now who is following that like well, mosaic laws I, I really doubt people are going to be able to track their mixed fabrics, tattoos. Well, that was in context stuff. of like these pagan rituals they were doing at the time. They're making, I forgot exactly which fabrics, but they were mixing the fabrics to make some like weird but, pagan but, thing. I mean, so you're, that's... you're referring to basically like receiving an analysis from someone on what the Bible actually would, would prescribe. Sure, yeah, I don't know if it could be quantified per se, but I think it is still true. And I think that's old law stuff anyway, which was fulfilled through the... Um, so, so it's not so right. So when you say follow the Bible, you're not talking about old law stuff. So well, no, that, yeah, that's well, Judaism. That's like a different thing. Right. Well, yeah. well the Old Testament is still very much inactive. Like when but, Jesus did his sermon on the Mount, he did not come to abolish the uh, old laws, but he came to fulfill them or whatever. Right. Like, right. You're, you're atheists. What do you, what do you, he, uh, John mentioned? We spend more time in heaven or hell. What do you think happens? What's your what's your view? Or do you think anything? Probably I just like going to sleep and never waking up. Yeah, I don't have the answers for what but, happens so, after death. To, yeah. I mean, you're, you're one, kind one, of you, you brought up the question of Christianity and religion, and I, I I will still push back and say a lot of the points you've made don't necessarily relate to religion, but I think they're part of the fact that the the Christian tradition it is very focused on your inner life and what some people might broadly call spirituality. Now that term is very frou frou and can mean whatever, but it's the idea that we are more than just our material senses, and that life has greater meaning than simply just input output pleasure. And I think that's not necessarily something that's just about Christianity. We are talking about a world that is a lot more material. And I think when you say it's more secular now, you're actually talking about how we are so much more focused on the material, whether that's uh, consumerism, like our, our obsession with social media and things like that. And I think we can actually track a pretty direct line for our happiness as as we have focused more on the material we have become more depressed as a society and particularly women because when we go to it's interesting when you go to a lot of these countries that we, we would call developing like they, they don't have all the luxuries that we do by and large they they have a lot fewer like i guess social problems they might consider themselves a lot happier happier yeah. than we are now that's kind of true but if you look at like the you guys like like teleology right because you guys are like christians if you look at like the grand design and purpose of humanity right it does seem like and i know a lot of people like to do this weird thing where we jerk off like well my god the actually the really underdeveloped societies that don't have cell phones are they're all so much happier and it's like to some extent that's true but like tim pool show doesn't exist in these societies right the ability for those poor us people to, the marvel <laughs> universe doesn't i said exist. those poor people yeah true yeah actually um but like I'm, I'm just saying that like there's a lot of really cool shit that we've created in kind of the more developed <clears throat> world it does seem like people tend towards wanting more autonomy the ability to choose otherwise the ability not to be railroaded into hyper specific lifestyles now humans acclimate really well believe it or not even people with locked in syndrome where you can't move anything but your fucking eyes even those people tend to report decent standards of living so i'm sure you can find really poor communities where the people are you know like oh you know we're happy we do our thing but with the ability to pursue and accomplish grander things i think we kind of owe it to ourselves as humans as being part of like the human race to continue to build towards those things we just and have I'm to not like i'm not against that i'm not saying that all of the modern luxuries that we have are necessarily bad i like clean water i'm i'm, I'm good keeping that but i'm just <laughs> the reason why clean I, water, <laughs> the reason why i bring that up is because 
I, I, you know, a lot of the things that we've developed now that people are so obsessed with, I just want to put into a perspective that that's not going to make you happier, right? The, the person who has like a, a happy family life, a happy home life, who lives in a mud hut, they are ultimately going to report more fulfillment and more happiness than you who is spending all of your time indulging in, in like social media, in, in this video game and in, in whatever it is. Not that those things are inherently bad though, True. but they I, are not a source of fulfillment. Yeah, I agree. I, I think social media uh, probably makes people unhappier, right? Yeah. Almost, yeah. absolutely, especially teenage girls. Yeah, Oof. yeah. And you especially, know what I'm about yeah, that? Instagram. <clears throat> like, yes, people will always choose things that are more interesting. They'll choose more autonomy. If you ask, you know, probably, uh, I don't know, 100 people who live in these lesser developed societies if they want to just get a free ticket to the U.S., most of them will probably say yes. I don't think people can choose reliably what is good for them just I based on their desires. Because think about with social well, but media. but you're choosing what's good for them, we right? Would, but all, I, don't, I, don't agree with, I don't agree with that. Well, just as a general idea, I think we all know that social media has like harmed us. I mean, you hear this all the time online with kids like, I wish we could just do away with it, go back to 2006. Most people would probably agree with that. But when it comes to actually doing it, nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to come together and like, okay, let's all go back. Like you said, it's impossible. We're never going right. to go back. I agree. Yeah, in terms of uh, people in lesser developed nations being offered a ticket here, a lot of them would say yes. I think most of them would say no. Hopefully. And and uh, But <laughs> it's, not, it's not because of... Um, I, I think the issue is for most people, their happiness and fulfillment is their family and their community. And what if you offer their whole family a ticket here? I don't. I I think still many of them would say no. Huh. So uh, we we've talked about blue zones, for instance. Are you guys familiar with the blue zones where people live to be over a hundred years old? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They interviewed this Japanese guy, and he's like chopping lumber, and he's like ninety nine or something. And they were like, "Why are you chopping wood? Like, have someone else do it." And he's like, "What do you mean? If I don't do it, who's going to do it? I have to do it." And they contribute, one of the reasons people live long lives is because of purpose, They because they have to, they can't stop, the people need something of them. For that reason, I think there are certainly a lot of people who are like, man, I dream of coming to the United States, and they do come every single day, some more successfully than others. But I think most people would probably just say like, if I leave, who's going to feed the pigs? You know, and, and they find fulfillment in their family and their community and their and their personal mission, which is maybe it's today we're making uh, uh, pork, maybe making shoes. Who knows? Yeah. And to bring things back to, I guess, men, and because we, we opened up with what's wrong with men, I think men especially, they thrive and need that purpose, the feeling that they are contributing to something greater. It's like you mentioned, John, that the whole, I'm not attributing it to PTSD because I, I would say that's a different thing too, but you know, a lot of people, service members who have seen come back to civilian life, they will say, oh, this is really hard to adjust to because you're in this really tight brotherhood. You have a very clearly defined mission that you're working to. Men do thrive, or a lot of men thrive in that environment. Modern society doesn't really look like that. Even the way that our careers are looking like, it's no longer the case where you just go to this one company and it's a very clearly defined hierarchy. It's very measurable, your goals, you work hard, you succeed. Now everything is everywhere, you're getting laid off. A lot of people are, they have their own jobs or side hustles. So it's, it's hard for, I think, a lot of young men to navigate that. They want to be out there slaying dragons the dragons are still there but they're a lot more amorphous and they don't have guidance as to what that looks like in this context yeah and everything is so feminized too it's just like not a conducive environment for like masculine you know flourishing i mean we don't have like traditionally male spaces anymore even like the last tool we had to kind of check and regulate male behavior like calling each other gay now people don't even do that as <laughs> that much that was it huh <laughs> wait how do we not have yes, traditionally no, male spaces real. what do we mean by that well because oh, we they've been coffee. integrated um we don't have oh, well like so what bad. male spaces are we missing I think that it was far more productive to have like Thank all so male much. classrooms, uh, things like the Boy Scouts, you know, these sort of like that social organizations. Gay. Well, oh, I went to an all boys high school. Careful. Oh, is that one? Oh, could you please? We have Speaking of gay, what is this again? Can you explain this drink to us? <laughs> Just an iced coffee. Just a Just regular, a Just a regular iced, iced coffee. coffee. See, I'm so comfortable in my masculinity. I can indulge in things like this and not be threatened by them. Uh, but I think that is true. Like, you know, the gay thing actually is real because it's not like you're being a homosexual, but it's like, you know, you're in a male friend group, a guy starts doing something weird, you're like, stop being gay. And then he's like, you're being gay. And there's like an impromptu sort of court martialing system. The other guys chime in, decide who was being gay. And then you move on from there. But now guys aren't as comfortable like checking their behavior. But, but, but why does that matter? Well, because I think that's how we, we grow up and we socialize. For both genders, I think it's really important that we have like the framework to kind of keep each other in check. I think it's really important that men for their own socialization, they're able to, for what, for a lot of women, looking at it would call bully each other somewhat Real. and for women we do that all the time women are way harsher enforcers of like societal rules amongst each other than men are and it's it's very vicious and toxic and uh, i think instagram has kind of exploded that too much i, I feel like I, at schools i feel like kids to bully each other are fucked on i don't think that's sure. it's become far but, less but, direct though it's much more catty so like it used to be you know like the maybe you know john hughes-esque like picking on the nerdy kid pushing him into a locker or whatever now the bullying because they have no tolerance for anything physical so it's much more catty 
and feminine. So what I saw, and this was actually like disgusting. Like I, I love bullying my male friends and vice versa. What I saw when I was in high school, which was six years ago, was you would take a kid who maybe would have been bullied, you know, 30 years ago, and you would have guys and girls hype them up and pretend to be their friend. There was this one kid yeah. I knew. He used to bring a beach ball to school every day. Great guy. It was just like his thing. He liked the way the beach ball, every day just carried this beach ball around. Kind of a weird kid. Great guy. But the kid, hey, what's up, man? All oh, take pictures and everything. And he thought they were his friends. And then, you know, it comes time for grad parties, comes time to, hey, you want to go? And they all like flaked right. on him. And he was so confused and traumatized by that yeah. because the joke was, you think we would actually be friends with you? The joke's not, you're a nerd. Stop being nerd. It's, you think anyone would actually ever want to be friends with you, you idiot? Like, I, I, I agree. <laughs> I, but I think there's a balance. <laughs> Is think, that a good thing? No, I'm saying that's worse. It's far worse. Wait, wait, I, I don't think bullying in the traditional view of it, the kid picking on the other kid, pushing him around, shoving him like, I don't think any of that's good. But I also don't like the inversion of that, which is this reverse bullying where, like you described, I've seen this, yep. where they take the kid who's unpopular and weird and they all act like they're, oh, you know, they do like, you're you're the prom king now. And it's actually scummier to yep. take someone who has some kind of like um, uh, social awkwardness and they need to be helped in that you can say like, hey, man, deodorant. It's your friend. I got this for you. Instead, they're like, what a good person. You're so great. Don't mention the stench. And then nobody wants to hang out. With right. Person. Because right. That, those kind of negative social enforcements, they're just as valuable as the positive ones. Like we, we want to live in a world where we're happy and getting along with each other. Some behaviors are, are less fun to be around than others, but we're no longer able to check those. And so they kind of explode. And then a lot of people wonder, why don't I have more friends? Why aren't, aren't yep. I more popular? It's like, well, it's because of this, this and this reason. But we weren't able to tell you that because that now that's politically incorrect. Yeah. I, I I, I know I know a dude who committed suicide and uh, nobody really picked on this guy, but he needed he needed a hard wake up call. He needed man. This guy probably would have made it if at a younger age, people just said, dude, you you need to stop doing these things. I'm, I'm trying to keep it vague. because I don't want to drag this guy's family or anything because he did take his own life. And it's sad. He was a friend of mine. Uh, nobody was willing to tell him the hard truth. Nobody was willing to tell him to, to put down the, the garbage. Nobody was telling him to clean himself. Nobody was, he, he wasn't getting into that social inter interaction. He but, grew up reveling in these really awful behaviors. And then when he was an adult, no one, no, no one who had to be around him would be around him. And then he, he, he took his own life. This Sad. is yeah. true, but every single person that talks about this, like health at every size and all this shit, misses this fact, okay? For it to be a hard truth or for it to be tough love, Tough love only works when there's actual love. Yep. People yeah. will walk yeah. around, especially conservatives, and they'll do this shit where it's like, you're a fat fucking loser piece of shit. Somebody has to tell you. And it's like, do you think that's like the impetus they needed no. to get to the yeah. gym? That's like there ha everything Absolutely. that you do, when you do tough love, there has to be like an underlying current of like, listen, you know, you can do better than this. I know you can do better than this. Like, you have to fix this thing. It'll be better for you. Everybody, like, there has to be that element of compassion. Otherwise, you're just shitting on somebody. Fa and I find that there's a lot of movements about, like, tough love that's not really, like, no I, offense. I, it, like, yeah, men right. don't give a fuck about women's health, but suddenly they really do when it comes to health at every size. Now every guy is like, well, hold on, the optimal body fat, blah, blah, blah. Like, you never give a fuck about women's health before. You're still going to bully people, you know? Right. So I think several, that's important. Several years ago, uh, Miley Yiannopoulos posted, he made fun of a guy who was overweight at the gym. And, oh geez, yeah. And yeah, I'm just like, that. but he did get a lot. I, I was happy to see how many people were dunking on him for that. Right. It's like the dude is at the gym. He's doing everything exactly. he could possibly do to improve himself. Leave clap. him alone. That's yeah. that's yeah. when you clap. That's when you cheer the guy on. That's when you're like, man, you are you are hitting it. Come back. We want to be friends. I I I, if, I feel bad when that when I see these stories of people who are overweight, unhealthy, and they're embarrassed or nervous to go to yeah. the gym. Yeah. No, no. I assure you, you go to the gym. The overwhelming majority of people are going to give you high fives and they're going to be cheering you on as you as you do that that work. And that's that that's real body positivity. Yeah, no, it's true. You, you have to have, like Destiny said, like the love from sort of above component. Otherwise, it's just like fake and you're just like channeling more rage online. Um, and like you said, too, at the gym, I mean, especially to like the guys who are like the total, you know, chads, they're like the most willing to help out because it really is a compliment in a way. Like yeah. if you go up to a guy at a gym and you're like, hey, can you show me how to do this? You're like implying that you obviously look like you know what you're doing. And so no one's going to be annoyed by that. That that is uh, manly affirmation. Yes. You're a guy, someone comes to you and says, I think you are better at this thing than me and I, I require some I, your, your expertise, your information, your capabilities. It makes you feel good. Yeah. I remember uh, this is around the 2020 election. I was at my gym back in Michigan and there was this kid who was maybe like 16, 17 years old 
skinniest person I've ever seen in my life. And he was just walking around the gym floor with the most confidence. Like his chest was out. He was like saying, hi. I'd never seen him there before. And he came over to me. I did like some bench, I think with like a supinated grip. It's like you hold the bar this way. I think it has like a better tricep activation or something. And he came over to me and like interrupted my workout, but not in like a rude way, more in just like a, you need to be talking to me. And I was like, obviously this is going to be interesting. <laughs> he was like, well, what was that grip you were doing? And I explained it to him and he was like, oh, Thanks, man. He like hit me and I was like, <laughs> I aspire to have this level of confidence. I mean, he owned the gym at that point. I don't know what happened. He was taking pre-workout or something, but it was just so funny. That's cute. Why, why do you think it is people want to be mean on the internet so much? Oh, they're miserable. Well, think about it this way. <laughs> I have never, I think about this maybe once a week. Paul Joseph Watson, right? I would call myself a big Paul Joseph Watson fan. Jesus. I haven't watched one of that guy's, <laughs> well, hold on. I haven't watched one of that guy's videos in like six years, but still I'd be like, yeah, I'm a huge fan. I've never left a comment on one of his videos. I've maybe only liked them to bookmark them for future reference. I've never like, so think about the kind of psychology you have to have to leave a mean comment. You have to like really be angry enough to just, I'm gonna, let alone, you know, if you say something terrible in a video that's obviously wrong, okay, yeah, you're gonna get dunked on. But just to make a video, maybe it's neutral, controversial or whatever, to leave like a mean comment or to leave a, a mean tweet, reply, something like that, you have to be in a certain state already to even like be there. I don't know anyone who does that, unless they're trolling. Well, I think part of it is uh, being online and the anonymity that is afforded to that. Now, I'm not saying we should get rid of online an anonymity, but there, it's just an objective fact that 99% of the people who say stuff about you online, they would never dream of saying that to your face. Yep. God, like, that's why I just... love fucking Facebook so much. It's yeah, it's... funny there. <laughs> Listen, you say that no one would want to get rid of anonymity. I firmly believe that once you hit a certain level as a content creator, you want all anonymity gone. I want the social security numbers, home addresses, <laughs> of all real. these motherfuckers, because nothing feels better than some fuck up making fun of you on Twitter or some shit, and he's got an account like you're like I know everything about you and then you go through his shit and you just light this piece of shit's light up but I don't have a care for that sorry um, but oh, no I yeah like the anonymity does I, the analogy I always bring up is if you play like FPS I don't know if it's still like this I haven't played CSGO in a long time but if you hop into a game and three people are on mic and one person is typing the one person that's typing is always the toxic fucking piece of shit because it's a lot harder to be mean in voice like yeah. I hate you blah 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 yeah. versus the guy that's typing on the keyboard it's like oh you're the worst player and it's like yeah okay dude I, I wonder if it is um it's just the distance. It's just you, you before the internet, you know, people would make prank phone calls. Uh, but if you were going to say something to somebody, you had to expect the real world consequences of the people around you watching and what the person, how, how, how they would react and what that would mean. Mm -hmm. Now online, it's like, I don't know you and I don't care. And that's the scariest thing to me. Especially um, as a content creator, there's this weird dynamic that we will all relate to where people almost like, like they'll say like unfollowed, unsubscribe yeah. just like like do you think you have power like they're yeah. like mad at you and they're like well i'm gonna get back it's like you you know and it sounds terrible saying it but it's like you are you are a number on a screen like i understand that there is a sort of parasocial relationship that like inevitably develops but people get like really you know personal about like who they follow who they give their time to and they try to like wave their finger at you it's, it's, it's literally thing. the dark knight rises scene where the guy is like I paid you a five dollar sub, <laughs> <laughs> and this that, gives you power over that's me. Destiny, yeah, yeah. Destiny, Destiny towering over his no, five dollars. You're getting banned. I'll ban you extra hard if you're a sub. You think you talk? You should know better. Okay. My, yeah, my, my favorite response is someone uh, commented, is like on Twitter, and they were like, "Guy, I didn't know you were following me in the first place. Yeah. Like you're telling me you're unfollowing me, and I'm like, oh, but you know that. Not that, that that's not so much what I you know what, what I'm talking to about you know people being mean online. It's like someone expressing their distaste for your opinions and telling you that like I'm not interested in following you anymore is a bit silly. Yeah. But there's like there are people who they they just all they have is going online and lying about other people and and make being mean just well, generally if they were to try that stuff. in real life, they would get punched in the face. But we're not in real life a lot of the times when we're online. It's the same thing with women. I mean, you know, most of the bullying that I think happens to women largely comes from other women. I think it might depend what content spheres you're operating on. But like, you know, a lot of the makeup people who get bullied for whatever reason, it's other women that are bullying them. But if, if these women were, I guess, in friend groups, there would still be bullying because they're women. But it would be a lot less toned down. We would be checking each other socially because that's not okay to do, like, to someone you know in real life, but because it's all online, we're all anonymous. There's no real consequences. It's just, it's a very toxic situation for a lot of people where they do indulge in behaviors that wouldn't be okay. 
You also, I think there's also the fact that be, you mentioned that word dehumanizing. Um, dehumanizing, like, it's a really loaded word, but like there is an aspect of dehumanization that you don't like see the effect of what you're doing on somebody. If yeah. you take most people and you put them in real life and you put them in front of somebody that's like earnestly trying in real life to make fun of somebody like that, and that takes a lot. You have to be almost like psychopathic to go after somebody like that. But online, it's super easy. And I don't know if you guys have the experience. Bro, I'll go to events where I'll meet fans sometimes. And the guy's like, oh shit. Like, I was a guy that, like, do you remember when I tweeted at you that, like, that last video you did was, like, the worst thing I ever saw? Like, I fuck with you all the time <laughs> online. And I'm like, why are you like this? Oh, yeah. I just say that shit. I'm just, like, fucking around or whatever. And it's yeah. like, okay, well, it doesn't feel that way <laughs> from my perspective, all... you know? People do that shit all the time. I'm like, bro, what the fuck? And he's like, oh, I was just say that shit just clowning, you know? There like, was a okay. kid at they, church. They, they apparently dedicate a lot of time to drawing pictures about... <laughs> yeah, that life. too, yeah. They spend a you, lot of time, like, drawing you specifically. Yeah, obsessing yeah. over... Yeah, but then when you meet in real life, they're like, chill. They're just like, oh, you know, I just like, I'm just like fucking around when I say that. And they don't realize, like, the impact that it has or what it comes off as because they're just not really thinking about it that way, you know? There was a kid at church who was, like, working the mass and I was leaving and he recognized me and he identified himself as, like, one of the guys who had, like, just said vicious stuff to me on twitter <laughs> but they're always so excited and you know their hands are like shaking when they yeah. reach and everything and it's just like okay i understand what this is and that's something i've struggled with i don't know if it's because i'm irish but like i get mad at people online you know if they want to come at me and so i've tried to like reorient my thinking where it's like look if you're saying this about me and i'm saying this about you then it's like anger but if you can have self-control and just like not reply not get involved then it just becomes sad that this person is you know putting all of that negativity towards you, spending so much time like just trying to come after you, then it's just like pathetic because it's like, is this how you make a living? In some it's, cases, what, yes. It truly, it, how old is your child, do you say? 15 months. Oh, fuck, okay. When you, so she's little, yeah. There's, they're getting to that age. There's something that happens when a child gets to like two, three, four, when you're starting to be able to say like right and wrong. You mm -hmm. don't do this. Um, and there's some, there's a phenomenon that happens where kids will start to do things and they're really just looking for attention. Right. And it, and there's a phenomenon where it's so annoying when parents don't understand this. This is the worst thing in the world you can do for a kid is a kid goes to hit somebody or do something they're not supposed to. And you look at the kid and you're like, oh my gosh, don't do that. That's not good. And you're kind of like laughing. You're telling them how to do it because what the kid is saying is they're getting positive attention for it and you're training them to engage in that behavior over and over and over again it's a very juvenile very dumb thing that like i shouldn't say dumb it's pretty sophisticated actually because they're trying to get that social uh, validation it's a form I, of communication for them yeah i think as people we all have that in us and i i'm gonna be totally honest there are times when i hop on accounts and i go into like other streamers chats i usually don't have time but sometimes i'll do it and it's Fucking with people is a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> when I say some, because I'm like, what? Because I know what triggers me the most, and I'll be like, oh my god, like I would so much rather watch this streamer do the blah blah blah. And you type, and then when the streamer gets mad at you, and they're like, why would you type that? And they ban you. I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> got him. I got him. Yeah. yeah, it does feel good. I understand the feeling because like, yeah, you get a lot of power. It's like the kid getting the attention from the parents. Like, yes, he saw me. Yeah, he, that's why you don't feed the trolls. Exactly. Right? That's exa yeah. it exists for a reason. It, women do that in a more, I think, backhanded way. It's like you'll do, say something like, oh my gosh, Kelly, your acne scars are healing up so great. It looks <laughs> looks so much better but it's this it's the same reason it's to elicit a response mm -hmm. yeah 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 i'm yeah, looking something. up the rule uh what's uh, rule 14 is that what it was i'll um, say that at the playground the my sons rule. are ever like beating kids up and up yes here. can you stop your son oh that's rule. he's looking for a reaction don't get involved <laughs> rule 14 of the internet if you argue with trolls they win mm -hmm. so you know i used to do i used to do things on on twitter and stuff when people would comment mm -hmm. i would say uh 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 it, it, something like uh, under uh, rule 14 of the internet, this conversation is hereby terminated. So like kind of trolling them back. I want to I want to move on a little bit, though, and ask you guys uh, with Sound of Freedom and Bud Light and other issues. I'm wondering if you guys think conservatives, the right, whatever you want to call it, has begun to win the culture war. Um, the more cynical part of me wants to say no, but I understand that, you know, it's a tug of war. So any ground gained, even if we shouldn't have lost it in the first place, is like positive. The Bud Light phenomenon is. It strikes me as very unique. I mean, obviously it is, but I don't think it's because all of a sudden we're figuring out how to fight the culture war. I think it's because you've got Bud Light, which people really weren't married to in the first place. You have so many other options for beers. Um, and then it was something that was so in contrast to the average life of the person who is, you know, drinking Bud Light to see like Dylan Mulvaney be put on the can. And they're probably like, okay, I don't really like it that much anyway. I'll switch to Coors or whatever. Um, with Sound of Freedom, that was like a legitimately good film. I recommend everyone go see it. To my knowledge though, they made that a few years ago and yeah, they were sitting on it ago. Mm -hmm. and they put it out recently. They couldn't get it out. And that is a good example of how to actually make 
culture. I mean, culture literally means just like what you are doing, what you are making. And the right doesn't understand itself, which is why we don't win anything. And especially not um, culture wars, because we don't know how to make culture. Because if you ask like a right wing person, hey, make me a piece of right wing art, they're going to draw like Ronald Reagan <laughs> shooting an Uzi, riding a velociraptor. And it's like, <laughs> okay, like, yes, but not really. It's funny. If you put that mural up in, say, Portland, it might get defaced because they hate Ronald Reagan, but more or less, it's going to stay there. You take something that's actually right wing, like something that is natural and good, like a mother cradling a baby, if you put that mural up somewhere, that would get defaced much quicker and with much more viciousness by some Antifa crazy woke person than would the mural of like Ronald Reagan because that is what is right wing, is just what is like natural. Even if you look in like a, a lot of- A mother cradling a baby would get defaced? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely I, think you're, I don't think that's Yeah. Funny. If you look at a lot of I mean, um, anything anything could get defaced, honestly. Yeah, like, but I don't think there's like these woke tards who are like, oh, this fucking traditional family structure. <laughs> <laughs> that that seems a little hot it would okay. be in Portland. Honestly, if it were a white mother with a white baby, it would. If it were a black mother with a black baby, it wouldn't. But if it were a white mother with a white baby, it absolutely would. I would bet money on it. I, um, I, I think it's fair to say there's probably some higher percentage that you're correct. But I think for the most part, art just gets defaced. And sure. I don't think anyone's going to be like, that picture must be, def like, I don't think anyone's going to Well, I guess an example targeting. of that you know would I mean? be, you know, you see this go on Twitter often where there'll be like a family picture of like, you know, eight white kids and their mom and you're just, oh, you know, happy. This is ecological terrorism. Something yeah, about this seems wrong to me. Yeah, I've seen people say just uh, having a large white family is offensive. And even if you look at like the most popular tropes in films, they all are in a way like right wing. I mean, you know, the good over the evil, the strong over the weak, the triumph of good. Jonathan Bowden writes about this extensively. That's right wing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like a lot of the traditional media is actually, if you, depending on how you analyze it, a lot of the movies we had growing up was actually the overcoming of toxic masculinity. They, that's true. So they will take uh, like a right wing sort of concept and they will redress it to be more egalitarian because they will replace, you know, the, the man with the woman or they'll add like woke stuff or gay stuff not or what even, have you. I, I'll, I'll fight a lot on this. If you think of like classic movies, how many old movies can we think of where you've got like the hot shot kid and he comes in and he's not a team player. He never passes to his friends and he quits his team and then he has like a day or two off where he like hangs out with somebody. He's like, oh, you know what? I need to call him. Like the... The Mighty Ducks is like a classic example of this. I'm sure there's a ton of other movies that are like this. And then the guy comes back and like either he wins the game because he's playing with the team or he passes to the other kid on the team and he wins. I feel like that's a pretty classic. I wouldn't call the, it like right wing or left wing, but like in framed in today's society, that feels like people would view it more as left wing because it's attacking toxic masculinity. But like I think there's a lot of classic tropes like that of like men the, overcoming their more. Yeah, the, the, the jockey guy was always like the bad guy. You know, it's the yeah, jockey guy was. Yeah, look at uh, Back to the Future. It's because yeah. it was the written jockey. by Hollywood nerd writers. Who yeah. You want to you want to know what right wing art is? Inserts. And I, I I think one of the issues is you are correct. The right doesn't know itself. And I constantly hear about this movie is too woke, so it's bad or whatever. Captain America, that's right wing. That's a right wing movie, hands down. Yep. It's mm -hmm. literally a movie about a scrawny guy who's trying to lie his way into the army, who becomes this like visage of stereotypical masculinity, who fights Nazis to save the day. It's like pro America. His name is Captain. Like th that's like. Very right wing. Yeah. Conservatives didn't come out and cheer for that movie. No, they it, ignored it. We don't even. We're like a fish in water, unable to detect what is around us. It's like hierarchy, the ascent of hierarchy. Another. This movie is so right wing that I thought it was right wing, and I I went to write a script for the video, and I was like writing out like, "Ha, huh, it'd be funny if I made this point." And then Mr. Incredible, it's The Incredibles, said something that was like borderline fascist, and I was like, <laughs> "Now I have to escalate it even further." Because you look at that movie, you watch, oh, superhero movie. That movie is about like said? the mask. Yeah, it was in the scene when uh, he's arguing with Mrs. Parr about you know uh he goes out you know to rob with syndrome or to stop the robbery with syndrome comes back and the wife is like where were you and they're talking about you know the school and he's going on about how like the school punishes excellence and no one's allowed to be great anymore <laughs> yeah. and i'm like this is so cool so i'm like okay now i have to escalate what he's saying but it's true i mean that movie is about like this man who had achieved greatness and now he's like literally incubated into this cubicle and he wants to That's use true. his strength to pursue good and everything around him is doing the opposite of that and look at syndrome the villain what does syndrome want to do he literally says that he wants to make everyone equal yep. because he's so traumatized by his past that he's like well now everyone's going to be super because no one will be because he was a dork and he wasn't mr incredible so he couldn't hang he couldn't stop bomb voyage <laughs> and he's taking it out on everybody else There's i applaud a, uh, your encyclopedic knowledge of this movie very well i, I, I <laughs> just you. watched the black clover movie on netflix it's anime and this is another great example matt walsh ragging on anime whether yeah, oh, what, he also rags on disney i will so what's fr games. yeah but, but, what's so frustrating me, but, about that is that so we're not let supposed me, to indulge degenerate culture, but then it, Disney movies are family friendly and we're uh, adult no, conservatives are, yeah, not anymore, but adult but, conservatives can't even watch like wholesome stuff. So we're all just supposed to watch Sound of Freedom all, all day, every day. Like, what yeah. is that? <laughs> the Black Clover movie is quite literally, so the story of, of, of Black Clover in anime 
is uh, people can, uh, at a certain age or whatever, they get a grimoire, a magic book that gives them magic powers. This one kid who desperately wants to be a magic knight in service of the crown never gets one. So he trains physically as hard as he can until he's so physically powerful, he's actually, he actually stands a chance. And then he gets, you know, some uh, anti-magic book with a sword. And in the arena where they're doing the test, this is the actual show, not the movie. He has no magic powers, but in the first battle, he's so fast, he just slams into the guy who has magic. Basically, the point of that show is hard work and merit makes, can make it possible. In the movie they put on Netflix, the bad guy literally wants to bring about a new world of equality. And in the yeah. great battle, the main character, Asta, is like, he, he, the, 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 the villain is like, the royal elites are, are oppressing the people. And Asta is like, no, whether you're a noble, a peasant, a farmer, or a warrior, we're all working together to make our country better. And I'm like, where are the conservatives to come out and actually celebrate things that, that uphold their values when all they do is complain about things that yeah. don't have their values? And those movies with the weird, like, f f fractured stories, like, they made The Craft too. I'm like, they don't do well. You know what I mean? Like, they're, they're not culturally significant. They got mad. I went and saw the new Indiana Jones, and I, I got, like, crap for it just because, like, it was woke or something because there was a female protagonist, which, have you ever seen those movies? I mean, that's, like, always a trope, and people are like, oh, it's woke. She's such a girl boss. But that's kind of the point is, you know, this girl is so prideful and annoying that her, like, literally 80-something-year-old uh, godfather has to come in and, like, you know, show her how it's done and because he is the adventurer. He is Indiana Jones. They got rid of Shia LaBeouf. And uh, yeah. you notice, too, a lot of the, like, more, like, woke film critics don't like that movie and i think it's because indiana jones and james bond these kind of franchises are like one of the last sort of authentic displays of like real adventure or like a hero archetype that like men have to project themselves onto because now if you look at like captain america like you mentioned what that has devolved into is like captain america fights for gay rights and stuff like that with the whole like mcu and i just don't think that that's as good of a, a role model for like what masculine leadership looks like i feel like for some of these things Firstly, I hate analyzing this as left wing versus right wing. I think it's the most weirdly politics brain thing. I think that there are good tropic type movies or bad tropic type movies. Trying to figure out if it's like right or left is kind of strange. Something that I'll be a little bit critical of conservatives on is sometimes, and I understand maybe because there's not good leadership in the Republican Party right now because there's a huge split between DeSantis and Trump and who knows what else is going on, is sometimes I think it would be better if conservatives could frame things positively rather than like attacking everything because sometimes it feels like they don't have a good, like what would, what would better represent be instead it's just like i don't like that there are so many black characters i don't like there's so many female characters i don't like that the man did this or that or that it makes me wonder sometimes there are classic movies that i consider 10 out of 10 movies that if they were to be released today i feel like conservatives would call them woke i feel like yeah. mm -hmm. legitimately um i'm not saying this is an opinion this is a fact if you disagree you're wrong mulan was an amazing movie yes. i feel like if mulan got released today i think conservatives would universally pan it wow a woman steps into a man's job robbing honor from her father and fights just as good as the men do she even beats up the makeup women aren't that strong Wrong. women can't do that that's not even not and it's emasculating as hell that she beats the boss and says like i feel like that would be the criticism like damn i don't know but it seems kind of sad i agree with the point uh the, the beginning story said, Mulan? With, Mulan. It's, it's, yeah. well, it's like, it's like yeah. a folk the, the, tale okay. this, this, is exactly, folk this is what i'm saying captain america comes out it's a it's a marvel film about a guy who's trying to lie his way into the military to serve his country mm -hmm. and where were the conservatives to be like this is the perfect example of masculinity hollywood so here's what happens there is no positive signaling from the right on what they do like, only negative signaling on what they don't like. Yeah. And how does, it, how does a movie theater, uh, a movie studio react to that other than, hey, when we do this thing, all these people are cheering from this, ignore the haters. Mm -hmm. yeah. If the conservatives came out and they were like, hey, look, look, Sound of Freedom is a good example. It beats Indiana Jones on a Tuesday. Obviously, Indiana Jones has like 85 million plus. But for the Tuesday, Sound of Freedom did really, really well, yep. creating an opportunity for studios to pursue these types of movies. A positive reaction is better in terms of growing culture than a negative one. Yeah. Well, we right. kind of had that with uh, Top Gun Maverick. I think that was, was kind of like that. returned to as like, you know, wholesome um, male lead character, hero archetype, very pro-Americana, kind of jingoistic with all the fetishization of the military, in my opinion. But I mean, it's a pretty, that's a pretty right wing movie. There was even like, like you mentioned, conservatives. And I think this is by our nature. I don't know how we would ever get around this. We don't know anything except for what we don't like maybe it's because the values that uh you know enabled the society that we want to conserve to exist we don't exactly embody ourselves which is why like destiny mentioned you know uh if a movie came out nowadays that was very popular back in the day we'd be like oh there's too many female characters too many black characters but at the same time 
we wouldn't actually want to make a movie without that because it'd be like, well, we don't want to be racist because we are so like cocked to the morality of the left. But the same thing with Top Gun Maverick, like conservatives liked that. But they liked it because it wasn't woke, which is to say it wasn't, yeah. you know, anti-America. It wasn't like, you know, over the top with like, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, stuff like that. But there are more subtle themes of that movie, which I do find this fascinating, like the left wing versus right wing analysis. I don't think present. it's so much left or right versus like subversive or upholding of traditional values. I think that is in itself left and right, um, like just as that even. But like with Top Gun Maverick. You've got this character who is kind of like James Bond in the sense that, like, he's obviously, you know, top of the league, he's excellent, he's competent, but he also maneuvers around, like, this sort of bureaucracy that's like, no, you have to do this this way, you have to do this this way. He kind of makes his own rules, and people really, like, enjoy watching that, this sort of, like, guy who is, like, very competent at his job and doesn't have to be governed by this sort of, like, algorithmic process, which most men nowadays have to follow. So I think that is very, like, inspiring to them to see that displayed. But a conservative wouldn't understand that. They would just watch and be like, oh the plane yeah, choo, 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 but they wouldn't understand like <laughs> why they like it which is why hollywood's like oh shoot they like this movie because america and planes well, let's make another let's make a reboot does it make money yeah with uh with bud light starbucks target i think you're starting to see companies get worried about leaning too hard into maybe not simply pride stuff but politics in general maybe no. yeah you have to keep in mind that this is a one this is kind of a forever losing battle is that if you have media or products that are focused on like diversity and inclusion, by default, you're going to have a much larger fan base. And that's something that conservatives kind of have to factor in. But it's in, not in just about well. diversity and inclusion, because if you look at the Fast and the Furious movies, those mm -hmm. are diverse. They're totally diverse. I have not heard a single person call those movies woke. So Agreed. there's a difference between wanting a broad audience no, and understanding this is a global market versus, mm -hmm. uh, oh, now this Viking Jarl is a black woman. Like, mm -hmm. they're, they're yeah. different. <laughs> That's one of the good things for, I want to say, almost every Tom Cruise movie I've ever seen. I don't know if Tom Cruise is involved firsthand in, like, declaring this or not, but I, I feel like almost, like, there are a lot of good female women characters in a lot of the movies he's in where it's yeah. um yeah. but did you see the edge of the day uh, the edge, edge of tomorrow, tomorrow? yeah no, oh, I love yeah it. that's a really yeah. good movie I'm the really strongest character arguably is a woman except for Tom. but you never ever get the inkling of wokeness from that movie yeah. ever and top gun though one of the pilots is a woman i think the one yeah. that goes and you never there's never a scene where she's like, i think i it, could do it better than the boys you know? right that's exactly. it it's yeah. not exactly. just about having strong mm -hmm. female characters which have existed in movies for a long time like i mean uh the, the aliens, aliens movie Terminator yeah 2, that's not a problem yeah. i think it's when that's coupled with the undermining of of men that's i think what makes it yeah. woke and what people don't like mm -hmm. yeah like that's I, the I, left I falling games. into the same trap as the right where it, we have this horrible problem as humans where we can never just fucking like something without shitting on the antithesis of it as well it's, it's not enough to be a playstation gamer you also have to hate the guys that play xbox <laughs> yeah. it's so it's not true. enough to empower <laughs> yeah. women you have to shit on men at the same time you know um, and exactly. there are so many scenes and some of the empower yeah because you go back like sarah connor um from the terminator movies or sigourney weaver um as ripley in the mm -hmm. alien movies these are amazing representations of 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 women and there were never or kill bill even they're modern examples yeah. too yeah where you don't have those woke moments where yeah the woman is outperforming the guy and it's like this is why i don't need a man I, I think hunger games did a really really great job of yeah. having a female lead she was the first and, ever female action star did you know that jennifer lawrence said that so oh you remember that yeah. that's so absurd Jeez, oh, this is the. Kind I think of, that like, was a misspeak. To be fair, I did see that sure. interview, and it was. But yeah, she but, apologized but, for but that. But yeah. think, think about the Hunger Games arc as compared to a traditional hero's journey of a man. Mm -hmm. Katniss Everdeen does not want to go to war, does yep. not want to be hero, and desperately tries to stop her involvement in the conflict. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting take on a female perspective in an action movie. Whereas the guy is usually like, "I have to go and do this, or else the world will end." And Katniss Everdeen is like. I don't want to go to war with you. Keep doing it. I'm protecting my family. Yeah. I, I mm -hmm. thought that was fantastic. And she, that's the thing too, is like she doesn't fulfill like the male archetype for that situation. Like you said, she acts like a woman, but she also is able to succeed. I mean, she's not like dealing with the conflict and just like, I am stoic. I mean, she's breaking down crying. She's exploiting her beauty to like get sponsors and, you know, advance further to protect her family, which is noble. I mean, we're not saying that like females are incapable of nobility, but you're exactly right. I mean, they tell the story without people in the audience being like, wait a minute. They're trying to cast, you know, her as a male character. And that's weird. I think that's what it is, is like watching the film, watching the characters and being able to tell that the way this character is behaving is unnatural. They are doing this because they are trying to pretend that like everybody's equal. And, you know, we can all just sort of like plug ourselves in where we will. You know, it's another piece of media that came out is very popular a couple of years ago that was right wing squid game. Remember squid game? Oh, totally right wing. Because and and these uh, 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 I, I'm finish your point. I got to I got to rant on this. They uh. 
people were like, oh, it's like this critique of capitalism. I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of right wing. But then it was also like the way the characters were being successful wasn't like, you know, a girl boss. Like there were the women characters who were using like their beauty and their sort of charm to like seduce the male characters. It was like, you know, might is right. I mean, the, str the stronger ones were winning until they were stupid and uncalculated like that big guy who ended up getting killed by the woman on the glass panel one. Sorry, spoiler. It's been two years. Watch the stupid TV show. Only um, two years? Yeah, so wow. I think it's fall 2021. Uh, okay, I, I, I got around on this because when the movie came out, I was like, wow, this is a huge critique of, of communism. And I get all these leftists being like, Tim's so dumb. The guy who made it said it was a critique of, a cr critique of capitalism. And I'm like, then this guy doesn't know anything about communism or capitalism. Yeah. Let's use the red light, green light scenario because it's been a long time since I watched it, but this was a really great example. In which system, contestants, are you likely to find everyone wearing the exact same clothes, starting from the exact same position and then being told, good luck? A capitalist system or a communist system? Because in a capitalist system, some people are born wealthy. That means they would be born with tools and advantages halfway across the room already and not have to start from the back. Yeah. If everyone's forced to dress the same, start from the same position, no matter how old or whatever, that is more of an, a, a forced equality system than a some people are naturally benefited. Hold up. Yeah. Okay, hold on. I have not seen this, but I'm still going to fight with this take. Okay, ready? <laughs> I've never watched more. a single episode. Real quick. What are the, there is a place... In the most capitalist country in the world, or one of them, the United States, where you can find a scenario like that, and it's prison, where people tend to start behind, they're all given the same clothes, blah, blah, blah. Wasn't the point of the Squid Game show, you're talking about the Squid Game show, yeah. right? Yeah, or the, yeah. I don't even know the what movie. the movie show. Wasn't the point of it was that every single person there had some big problem, and that's why they were there? They were so all they're all in facing debt. debt. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah. then that so then that is more of like uh people fucked up first and then kind of like instead of going to prison you can go to the squid game to I guess like get money or whatever. So that I don't know if I would say that's a pet fair. That it feels like pretty capitalist to me that a bunch of people that get fucked in life and debt are now in another fucking rat race where they've gotta, you know, try to fight but, against but, this, but, but that's not a unique to capitalism. It'd be the, the like fact capitalist. I'm not saying it's unique to capitalism, but so far the, as the, that's the, usury, the, that's like loans which people the, on the right don't like. The idea that <laughs> the scenarios Yeah. The, the idea that no, I mean the Catholic Church banned that. That's why. Jewish How do you buy people... a house? No, I understand traditionally, yeah. like your is bad, but like I'm pretty sure Catholics want to borrow money, right? Well, I mean, you want to borrow money, but we we disavow usury. We don't like usury, like loaning with high interest rates. Exploiting. What is a people. high interest rate? Exploiting. I mean. I mean, well, think about it this way, like the way that people perceive money nowadays, I don't like with student loans, I sympathize with the idea of them being forgiven because I don't think that people understand how interest works, how money yeah, works. And yes. so, and credit card companies know this. I mean, these people, it's predatory. I don't like predatory Wait, so do lending. you think people should never be able to borrow money? Absolutely not. I think that there, and I don't know what the exact number is, but there is something to be said about people exploiting people's desperation and need for money and trapping them into debt for more or less the rest of their lives. Wait, so how do we buy houses or cars? I'm not saying that lending in itself needs to be outlawed. I'm simply well, who's going to lend that, money like, if you don't get interest think about on Squid it? Squid Game. The amount of debt you have to have to be in Squid Game. I am saying that type of lending is predatory. It's obvious before you make that amount of or that loan that this should have been taken into account. You can sort of tell what the people's circumstances are. I think that should more or less be outlawed. I think that's absolutely wrong. I'm not saying if you have your 20 percent, 10 percent, 5 percent, buy a house. But I'm saying like you know these high interest rates, like 20, 30 percent for credit cards, student loans, things like that, should absolutely be discouraged, not allowed. The, these were not components of Squid Game. Right. What was they were in debt though, right? Yeah, they were all they were all in debt, I don't, and they were competing I, for a lot of think, money. I don't think they were all in debt. I think well, they were it was, all competing for money. Right, there was a a big thing that filled with money or whatever. Yeah, but uh, uh, the idea that it's a critique of capitalism is incorrect because to to be fair, as you know, to try and give someone the benefit of the doubt, the movie is a critique of authoritarian corruption and centralized. You economics. keep saying movie, it was a show, right? It was yeah, a movie. it was a show. Oh, oh, it was a show. It was a show. Oh, sorry, it was a show. There okay, go. go ahead. Sorry. Okay, yeah, but. Yeah, there you okay. go, show. Sure. But 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 the, the general idea is you get these people saying, and even I guess the guy who created it, it's a critique of capitalism because they were powerful people who are, you know, uh, controlling and manipulating people this way. And I'm like, that's not what capitalism means. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Communism being the political structure. I'm not saying it was a socialist film. I'm saying the idea of private trade versus public trade is not necessarily a component of what I'm criticizing. I'm saying authoritarian control that puts people on the same clothing and then drops them off and, and exploits them is not what capitalism is. You can call it corporatism. You can say it can arise from an unchecked capitalism. But if we're actually talking about private ownership versus public ownership, that's not what Squid, Ga Squid Games was criticizing. Yeah, there's this interesting phenomenon where 
people will try to make art that is conveying like a left wing message, but then the audience perceives it much differently and ends up liking it. Like you'll see my favorite example Fahrenheit is uh, 451. Alan Moore, I think is the author uh, who wrote Watchmen. And you've got this Rorschach character who was written expressly to be this like bad guy, this fascist character. Uh, and everyone like loves Rorschach. I mean, I watched that movie for the first time at the advice of my friend. I was like, he's literally me. I mean, he's like, you know, this moral absolutist. He's like complaining about liberal hippies and all this other stuff is the crime and everything infests this city a far cry five you know you've got that one song like keep your rifle by your side they write that to make fun of um yeah keep your rifle by your side they write that to make fun of like christian conservative homesteaders it's like an anthem now everyone I loves think that same song. with fortunate son like a lot of people think of it as like oh this like pro america is like no that's not yeah like, very <laughs> i mean like i don't i would say conservatives oh. aren't above analyzing things incorrectly too though right how many conservatives i think even at a fucking trump rally they play that Bruce Springsteen song born yeah. in the USA. Yeah. That is, I don't care how you look at that it. Not, you're never getting a well, pro-America song out of that other than I'm hearing the chorus over and over again. I, born. Yeah. I was going to say uh, Fahrenheit 451 was, uh, there's a famous story where Ray Bradbury was like giving a lecture and they interpreted it as the, the, the move, the, they, the, the students interpreted it as the government censorship and he was like, no, 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 it's about the public demanding it and they were like, no, you're wrong. He's like, well, I wrote this book. Yeah. But uh, in terms of Rorschach, this is really, uh, uh, this is funny because I think Alan Moore, the, the, the writer, right? It was, it was Alan Moore. Um, he had said it was supposed to be a smelly, disgusting, like far right or whatever you want to call it. People weren't supposed to empathize with this character. Yeah. The problem is Rorschach, his, his, look, you want to make someone a bad character? Don't make their, their arc that they caught a guy raping and murdering children and it caused them to snap. Yep. Because no matter how awful the person is in terms of his moral absolutism, you are like, somebody witnesses something like that, I can understand them snapping. It's not a good character, but you're not going to hate, you're not going to feel hatred, you're going to feel like a sadness yep. for what drove them to their, to their, to their madness. Not only that, the, the, uh, uh, whether it's the comic or the movie, when he's in the, the, the scene in the movie where the guy tries to kill him and he grabs the tray and blocks the knife so cool. and then splashes him with the boiling oil and says, I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. This is this is a guy who was defending himself and then told him to back off. So by all means, criticize him and say he's supposed to be a bad character, but you write him in this way. Like, come on. I, I mean, that's, that. a, that's a sign of a good character, right? Like even mm -hmm. like I would argue that um, the first Avengers movie with Thanos or whatever was written as a very sympathetic um, to Thanos. lead villain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. say that. Yeah, yeah. I've he heard, I've heard uh, right wing commentators say that it's anything where there's like gray areas morally is leftist because of moral relativism. It's like, okay, I understand what you're trying to say, but a good villain will have their own justifications for what they're doing. Otherwise, it's just cartoon evil, and mm -hmm. that's not yeah. interesting. And uh, we we went a little bit over, so I'll end with my final thoughts. That's why Final Fantasy 16 is awful. <laughs> it was a, it was a terrible game. I stand by this. Everyone's allowed to be mad at me. Uh, I won't spoil the game, but it is. It is lower than one dimensional. So, yeah. Which uh, isn't always bad, though. I will say that. There is a play, there's a time and a place for Game of Thrones, which is incredibly seven dimensional. Yeah. Okay. God bless the ending of that show was so fucking horrible. <laughs> uh, and there's also a time and a place for Lord of the Rings, which is incredibly one dimensional. Agreed. It's literally Agreed. the biggest, baddest bad guy and the goodest, goodest, good. But it's like, yeah, there's a time and a place to enjoy different types of media, I think. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, we are, we, we've been going for a couple hours. I don't know if there's any, anything you guys want to say before we wrap up or just shout anything out. Uh, follow me on YouTube, youtube.com slash destiny, kick.com slash destiny, and instagram.com slash destiny. And I'm now on the new, hip, exciting uh, Gen Z website, Threads. Oh, yeah. That just sounds like some 50-year-old executive trying to be hip with the kids. Threads.com threads. slash at destiny. I can't stand Threads because my feed is just a bunch of random garbage. It's it's all random people. I just don't you care. You gotta interact with it so you can but, like, tailor the feed or whatever, right? Like I, I pull it up and it's like some... Dude, I don't know who like Fro Fro Frobo is, and like listen, social media is in a dire strait. It's either that, or we pick up Twitter and we got more pictures of black people fighting. All right, that's where we're at. <laughs> that's where we're at right now with social media. Okay, Tim, stop being so fucking picky. All right, <laughs> or Hunter Biden. We love Hunter. Yeah, Biden. more Hunter Biden. Yeah. I honestly, here's a hot take. I would have been more offended if they had found marijuana than cocaine. <laughs> I will not elaborate. <laughs> yeah. um, you can find me at youtube.com slash John Doyle. I really mean that. I'm not just saying that. I want you to go. I want you to check out the content. It's frequent. It's wonderful. Many are saying this. Go check it out. Thank you. Okay, so I feel like you're kind of shaming with the frequent content thing, but I do upload sporadically on my main channel, Lauren Chen. That's uh, social political issues. My media channel is Mediaholic. Talk about pop culture. And uh, I'm at the Lauren Chen Twitter, Instagram. And uh, if you really like my stuff, I'm also on Blaze TV and TPUSA. Oh my God. Can I hijack one minute of your show? Can I ask you a question? I'm actually super curious. 
Um, Maybe. When people talk about traditional relationships, it ties into our more than the discussion on <laughs> Squid Games, okay? To our original topic. Um, when people talk about like traditional relationships, traditional lifestyles and everything, how do you personally, and obviously as much as you're comfortable saying it, balance the fact that you're a mother but you still want to work? How do you like, yeah, what is that like in your mind? Or how does that, So you know? I guess uh, Bernadine Bluntly, she's a, she's a, I guess, Christian mom influencer. She's talked about this before. So I'm totally just going to mm -hmm. steal some of her thoughts. It's like, if we look at the Bible, you know, especially in Psalms, there is the example of the industrious wife who is supporting their family. Mm -hmm. So I think it's pretty, I'm not someone who thinks that women should never leave the home or work at all because that just even historically in very Christian societies is not what it looked like. So I view my responsibility as a wife and as a mother to help however I can with my family. Now, right now, obviously, 90% of the time I am just looking after my kid. I film videos part time. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty different than the modern world of view of career number one or even 50 50 split. So I mean, and, and I've never claimed to be trad. But I think my my stance is that having a family is way more important and way more fulfilling than a career will ever be. So in terms of my how I spend my time, my day to day life does look like that. Okay. But also, I think it's important to acknowledge, like John was saying, we live in a world, there are bills that exist. Like, uh -huh. I, I'm not going to shame. And I've seen people online do this, like, if, if a mom is working because she literally has to help her husband to pay bills and you're shaming her, is that pro-family? And it's a different thing to say we should examine why we can no longer have you know, all these moms staying home because we need two incomes. But to actually take an individual, someone who's actually married, actually has a kid, and to shame that person because, like, she needs money to support her family, that's not pro-family, that's not pro-Christian. But we see a lot of people in the red pill community doing that. And I'm just like, dude, w w like... Okay. Yeah, the problem what is if like doing? the career is the utmost goal instead of the family. Like if the career is yes. serving the family, it's like, are you really gonna have a problem with that? Also to clarify, I was not taking a shot at you. People get mad at me because I only post like four times a year. So that's okay. I had to <laughs> gaslight the audience. <laughs> right on. Cool. All right, are we done? We're yeah. gonna we're gonna go eat cheeseburgers and have sushi. A cheeseburger. A cheeseburger. Oh, I will have a cheeseburger. All right, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. This has been uh, a blast. These, uh, you know, we're we're figuring out the format and all that stuff. I do think it's funny that um, the more contentious the character, the more views you get. And when it's like a calm, reasonable discussion like we had now, people are like, oh, that was fun. But you're she not going to spoken more about cuckoldry. You're not going to get the shock <laughs> content. You know, you're not going to get the like smack down the, the blood sports kind of thing. But uh, it was a blast. So thank you all for, for hanging out. We'll be back yeah. next week. We're having a big one next week. We've got some uh, some some uh, celebrities coming. Ooh. And so it should Ooh, be you have a hint for that. No, nope, no, sir. So uh, we need to get to the, we need we need to figure out the mechanics of it. But I'm thinking like on Monday we put out like a flyer like this Friday 10 a.m. Here's what we're gonna have. So maybe on Monday the uh, we can do some announcement. But people cancel, so it's it's really tough. But anyway, uh, we'll be back tonight at 8 p.m. over at YouTube.com/slash/TimCastIRL. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for hanging out, and we'll see y'all then.